I think we're back. Hopefully. Let me see if I can get this stream linked out to all of y'all. Uh, let's see here. Let's see here. All right, get shareable link. Are we doing better? All right. Ha ha ha. <laughs> Let's see. I want to see if we actually have a real live stream. Yay! <laughs> Hey, thanks for coming back. Okay, someone said still choppy, better. What did I do? I restarted everything. Oh, and I just made the background, um, like I took out any moving parts that we didn't need. So just a regular background now. Hopefully that'll fix it. That was my wife's idea. She's so smart. Um, okay, okay. I think this is a better situation now. So all better. Hey, thank you guys for coming back. Sorry about that. I, I think it's better to do it right than to do it badly and try to stick it out. So, you know, <laughs> we'll have a good stream now. Thank you, Jesse, for the idea. She was like, why do you have a moving background? And I was like, cause it looks cool. <laughs> ah, so smart. All right, everybody, glad to have everybody back. Um, let me give any newcomers or people who didn't catch this in the last stream the, the whole plan here. So for the Shadow Dark RPG Kickstarter, one of our stretch goals, um, for the $500,000 stretch goal, which still blows my mind that we met, um, we decided to do a community mini dungeon where we all kind of design one together. Um, because this this is a really cool thing in that we can give this to everybody who's like a new Shadow Dark RPG player. And I think we can use this as an example of how I design mini dungeons um, so that, you know, in case it informs anything that you all try to do or gives you a leg up on your own design process for Shadow Dark RPG. Um, and, oh, I see we've got some familiar faces in the chat. We've got Hankerin. It's nice to have you here. Scott. We've got, oh my god, we've got Taff, Jake. Oh my gosh, people who have designed for Shadow Dark RPG before and better than I do. So let's, <laughs> you guys are spurring me on to, to keep up with you. Um, so, yeah, whatever room I'm in and my Wi-Fi is weak, I actually was on Ethernet, so I switched to Wi-Fi, and so if we're, it's doing better. But anyway, we won't, we won't um, continue to, we won't continue to focus on the tech problems. Hopefully, they're solved enough for us to work. So, um, this is what we're gonna do, you all. We're gonna make a dungeon from scratch together using the, the general process that I use. Um, it's a mini dungeon. I haven't planned anything ahead of time because I want this to be a very honest. Uh, attempt at this you know we may or may not do super well um, but we'll keep working at it till we have a good final product even if I have to finish it up I, I will have to finish it up off screen because I'm gonna actually draw a map out for us as a result of what we do and turn it into an actually you know drawn thing with a, a VTT map that we can all use um, so the um somebody asked if the premium pdf is supposed to be the standard book yes it is i perseverated on that for a long time um the premium book is premium only in its physical manifestation otherwise it's identical to the core book and it's a lot harder to juggle two separate pdfs and make corrections to two separate pdfs so i'm keeping the pdf between the two the same that means premium people also get both pieces of art so i hope that makes sense okay you guys we are gonna start. I want to show you guys the the next screen I have, um, and kind of the this is gonna be sort of a hacks process and tips and tricks for literally how I sit down and write a brand new mini dungeon. So let's switch screens for a second here, over to here. Hopefully you guys are seeing a totally different view at this point, and you're seeing something which might look familiar to some of you because today was the day that we got to share out PDFs to everybody finally. Um, so what you're seeing is a map from a, one of the mini adventures that's already in the Kickstarter rewards, um, another one of the expanded stretch goals. And this is the map for Twisting Caves of the Pale Ones. Um, now the reason I have it here is because uh, when I start to write a new adventure, the first thing I do is uh, pull up a template from an old one, you know, and I kind of genericize it. I, I take out the... 
um, the, the information you can see here, like the title and fill and background information. Um, so we're going to build up from here because I'm a big advocate of not reinventing the wheel unless you have to. If you've made a good template for yourself already, you should continue to use it and kind of take out that, that decision making and layout process to the degree that you can. Now, I'm not saying use the same template every single time because that might stop you from innovating, but when you're making something and you want to retread some familiar ground, this is how I do it. So, um, okay, you all. So the, the next thing I'm going to do for us, and this is when we're going to start to need some community input, is I, of course, have a few books with me. I have the trusty Tome of Adventure design. Um, this book is just a go-to for me. Um, and then I also have the Shadow Dark RPG core rules right here. So a lot of you now have this as well as of today. And so this is going to be great fun as we look through this and you finally get to see the entirety of the Game Master chapter, which is not only, I think, the longest chapter in the book, but also my favorite chapter. Um, a lot of it did not appear in the Quick Start Guide for good reason because it's just a ton of information. But there are innumerable role tables in here that I think we'll have some fun using as we're generating an adventure. So let's see, we'll, we'll come back to this, especially if we need like some traps and hazards ideas, but for the, for the overall ideas, I actually think it's fun to start in the Tome of Adventure design, that's where I often go. So the first thing we need is for the chat to start rolling us some numbers. I hope you all brought your dice. Um, the very first thing I want us to roll is a location overview, and that's gonna be on page 18 of the new Tome of Adventure design, which was a beautiful Kickstarter by Matt Finch recently. Um, so, okay, chat, this is what I need. I need someone in chat to roll some D100s for me. All right, we got an 83, 66. I'm gonna start noting these down. Uh, 83, 66, what else have we got? I'm gonna keep flipping between windows. 30, all right, and let's get one more for good measure. I see a 74, okay. So I'm gonna turn this into some words now for us. So. 83, looking on these charts, which span multiple pages since they're so robust, is star, what's 66? Star keep, ooh, of the, and now number 30, of the diseased. And finally, 74, of the diseased priest. Oh, that's kind of cool. I like it. Um, what if you guys don't have the books, Dennis? That's okay, I have them. So I'll show you what I'm doing, and then if you get the books or ever want the books, you can do that. You won't need these to participate. I'll just be asking for roles and ideas. So cool, we have a really cool idea, Starkeep of the Diseased Priest, that's one idea. Now here's, I always come up with a couple, um, because you wanna see what grabs you, right? So let's have the next round here of roles. Um, Let's have <laughs> Starkeep of the Plague Priests. I know, I love it. Um, okay, everybody, let's do another round of rolls just because the chat already scrolled past for me. So, <laughs> all right, we got a 69, we've got a 68, and then a, an 82, and a 34. Those were the first numbers I saw, so let's construct that one now. So we've got, <laughs> why is 69 moaning? Of course it is. Um, and then 68 is, uh, da -da -da, labyrinth. Wow, labyrinth. Can I spell that? Yes, I think I did. Um, of the, this is already, I, I'm already afraid to look at the chat based on that first roll. And then 82 of the resurrected. And the last number, 34, is going to be cultists. Wow. I kind of like, I kind of like, it's just too funny. <laughs> Matt Finch, you know what you did. Um, all right, you all, we're gonna do one more. We always do three. So four more numbers. Let's see it. Let's see it, chat, four more numbers. <laughs> I'm immediately blocking the number 69 because. <laughs> uh, terrible rolls. I have terrible rolls. Uh, I see you throwed me, threw me a 20. Oh, I saw a one in there. I'm whatever number my eyes first land on. 31. I think people are just making numbers up now. Um, but that's what dice are for. All right, last idea here. So 20 is concealed. Ooh, that's kind of cool. Wow, how did I just get an emoji? Concealed uh, Abby of the 
31 of the drag oh dragonfly um and then 55 of the dragonfly horde oh this is rad you guys i don't know about you i don't know if you can see that that set of notes but um I have a personal favorite here. All right, chat, so I wanna see from the chat, uh, out of our three ideas, I have some ideas for each one of these, and you might as well, because these are so evocative. They just immediately give you images in your head. Um, but let's see some votes here. So uh, throw your favorite uh, your favorite idea into the chat, and I wanna see what comes up the most here, because we're just gonna to have to go with that one. Concealed Abby, <laughs> moaning. <laughs> moaning Labyrinth is one. Concealed Abby, number three. All right. Uh, Dragonfly Horde. Wow, I'm seeing. Okay, I'm seeing Starkeep Horde. I'm trying not to use confirmation bias here. I'm seeing a lot for the Concealed Abbey in the chat. I th I, stop me if that's not fair, but I think I saw the most for the Dragonfly Horde, which, in my opinion, it sounds the coolest as well. I immediately got a ton of cool ideas. And when you're choosing an adventure to write, um, it's got to be something that inspires you. It's got to be something that gives you images. And best of all, images like you've really never imagined, which is why I love roll tables for generating overarching ideas. Um, because you want to smash ideas together that you never would have thought of on your own, um, never would have thought of on your own. Um, and I think that uh, this keeps us away from sort of the standard kind of over-treaded ground. Like we've all been on an orc, orc attack caravan. We've all cleared out giant rats in a basement. Um, you know, we've all gone into a goblin cave. So uh, roll tables like this, like give us the really truly sword and sorcery stuff, stuff of um, imagination and excitement that you just wouldn't, Probably, I would never have been able to come up with that on my own. So this is why we're going to proceed then. Let's proceed with number three. So I'm going to put this up at the top here. Um, Concealed Abbey of the Dragonfly Horde. Very cool. So the first thing I'm going to do is jump over to our InDesign document. And let's title this the Concealed Abbey of the... I can already see we're having a problem. Dragonfly Horde. I'm going to extend this out so that it fits. Oops, don't do that. You're, you're going to see me struggle with InDesign. We'll leave it like that for now since it kind of fits. Um, if our map gets in the way, we'll have to pull this back a little bit. Um, number three was personally my favorite. So maybe a little bit of confirmation bias here, but that's what that's what I wanted to choose. So next thing I'm going to do, you all, is start to prep our document for writing. So I'm going to delete this map. Boom. Now there's all the little markers left. Um, I love reusing these. Uh, these are tiny boxes. <laughs> Scott says I knew which one you liked. I can tell from your face. So we're gonna we're gonna reuse all these numbers. But um, what I'll often do is I'll just grab like often I'll use this um, gray box either for uh, monsters or for you know to denote uh, a creature of some kind. So and I like I, I'll save some of these little boxes off to the side and I'll just start kind of deleting the stuff we don't need. As long as you keep one, you can kind of duplicate it going forward. Um, so we got that. I'll just save this little trap doodle. Ah, we already have one actually down here. So deleting, deleting, deleting. Let's save the numbers, um, cause we're going to use these. So now we need to start coming up with some room ideas. This is a dungeon crawl. Um, and so I'm going to start throwing some boxes down. We'll use these later. Um, yeah, we'll just we'll just make a, a square outline boxes. Where are you controls? Oh, I can't seem to. I lost all my controls up at the top. Hold on, I'm gonna scroll this around. This is what happens when you resize in design too much. You like lose everything. Um, essentials. Classic. Come back, my control window. Where are you? Um, do 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 do. Layers, links, objects, output. Yeah, this is a, this is a lesson. And once you have an InDesign setup, you like don't mess with it. Um, let me see if I can get this to work. I'm moving things around. Layout. Let me see if I highlight in here. Do we get our text controls back? Of course we don't. Oh well. Oh well. All right, we'll just proceed without it. Um, resize this so it fits. Can you all see this okay? All right. Let's see. Do, do, do. I want to make this a box. 
window, workspace, essentials, workspace, essentials, classic. Come back to me. Hmm. Well, you know what, we'll find it. Mm -hmm. Mm. If I just keep switching the view until I get what I want. Oh, yes, I did it. Okay. <laughs> so I'm actually just going to put some black line around this, and then the box itself will be empty. There we go. So we can start to use this box. See? Just click around until you get what you want. That's how, that's how InDesign works. <laughs> Is JP Coovered in here? Hi. Oh, hey, JP. Awesome. Okay. So... You guys see me struggle with InDesign. This is all part of the process. Now, I'm gonna start to uh, reuse this box for stuff, but the first thing is we're gonna start to make some rooms, and we wanna make um, just an outline of, of uh, the number of rooms and kind of what direction they all move in. Um, and so I'm getting all this stuff out of the way here, but let's see. I'm pulling up our, oh, grab. It's hard to grab boxes when they're only just the outline, just be warned. So when we're talking about a mini dungeon, which is what we're doing for this, uh, we're assuming that we're going into a, a location um, and that we're going to have to create, you know, it's not going to be like an overland or a hex or an open thing. We're going to have rooms that are connected in the sequence. So the first thing is room number one. I'm going to put room number one right here. Now we'll, we'll have relative sizes represented by these boxes, but we don't need to know everything right from the start. We just need to generally know what our rooms are about. So room number one. We have a variety of options when designing a dungeon. Um, we've got trap rooms, treasure rooms, combat rooms, social encounter rooms, uh, we kind of puzzle rooms or riddle style rooms. So we want to make sure that when we're designing here that we want to have a variety of stuff. Um, you know, it's not just going to be combat, combat, combat. And we also want to make sure we're giving adventurers a chance to move around the space. So for a mini dungeon, we're probably talking about, you know, approximately eight rooms here. So what we can start to do is, is plan out some ideas of what we want our rooms to be. So three, all right, so room one, um, we'll just put in filler for now uh, so we can come back and start typing notes. But let's give it eight rooms just out, you know, to start. Um, so chat, this is when we get thematic. Um, we've got concealed, Abby. These, these are two things that are informational to us already of the Dragonfly Horde. Now to me, Dragonfly Horde speaks of the monsters that we're gonna encounter inside or whatever the opposing force is gonna be. Um, it might even speak to treasure, like maybe the Dragonfly Horde is like a bunch of golden dragonflies or maybe it's warriors or maybe it's actual dragonflies for all we know. Um, what if there are dragons with insectoid, par oh wow, puzzle room first, wow. So this is this has been fun, um, seeing some ideas already cropping up here. Um, now, concealed Abby for the first room, I think that some kind of thing that, that connects back to this concealed idea is warranted, right? Um, if it's a hidden Abby, it's gonna be hard to find, um, or the way in might be concealed or hard to find, which is definitely a kind of a cool puzzle idea maybe. So, oh yeah, golden and jeweled dragonflies. There, there has to be dragonfly treasure in here. There has to be. Um, so let's maybe think about the first room being concealed in some way. So perhaps from the outside or perhaps a way to proceed through it are hidden. All entrances are hidden, I'm seeing. Um, the priests are actually dragonflies. Maybe the way in is a deadfall. Oh, that's really interesting, Jordan. Um, yeah, the way in maybe... We're talking about dragonflies. There's a presumption that they can fly. So maybe the way in is actually just a very difficult path down. And it's a secret shrine. Oh yeah, the room is a shrine, a secret door into the abbey. Abbey is ooh, underwater in the middle of a city. Wow. Um, oh, question. Concerning leveling is done by treasure gathering. Are there a rule of thumb for how much treasure to put in? No. No, there's no specific rule of thumb. Um, that is completely under the control of the game master. If you want your characters to level faster, you put more treasure, and if you want it to be slower, you put less. Um, so, all right, all right, let's see. Uh, a hidden, I really like that deadfall idea. So I feel like the first room should maybe have the, the, the hidden element or the, you know, the barrier be some kind of hidden deadfall. So I'm scrolling down, hopefully y'all can see this okay on the stream. 
but this is sort of a, a template for what we're gonna um, have our rooms be. So let's call room number one a deadfall. Um, and, hmm, I'm imagining sort of a mist-shrouded area that already makes it difficult to find an entrance. So let's say a mist-shrouded um, narrow canyon. Um, like the players have to approach this, you know, overland somehow. And there's this narrow, like, crevasse or canyon that they can stumble upon in the mist. Um, if they have a map, I suppose that would be helpful. If they know where they're going, that would be helpful. Um, if they have a ranger class that we're going to design in a couple weeks, maybe that will be helpful. But um, I like the idea of it being concealed naturally and maybe off somewhere remote, you know? So we'll, we'll take note of that. Um, and it's a mist-shrouded narrow canyon. Now let's make this difficult to uh, get down. Um, what would be dangerous for characters of any level? Um, let's see, water spills, the devil creating a pool below, follow the pool. If there's a pool, it would be hard. It would, they could just jump into the water, right? Some kind of pool. Um, yeah, ground fog. Yeah, definitely some ground fog. A misshrouded narrow canyon. Um, rolling fog conceals um a 60 foot drop into hmm hmm moss oh this is a good question so i'm seeing moss quicksand let's talk about what kind of environment this is um are we talking desert forest um something else what do you guys think uh let's see what the chat thinks what do, when we're talking about um something which i think you know, we're talking about Concealed Abbey of the Dragonfly Horde. Uh, what environment does that uh, give you? Loose rock. Swamp. Ooh, swamp. Interesting. Marsh. Marsh, canyon, swamp. Okay. Oh, jungle. I'm seeing lots of options. Volcanic. <gasps> so many cool options. Um, you know what? I know everyone's feeling swamp and wetland is the main thing I'm seeing, so let's go with that. Swampy wetland. It's funny because like the last live adventure I wrote, uh, or I have been writing in another adventure writing series was also swampy. So how can we differentiate this? The last one I was doing was kind of Everglades, so let's, let's make this just more mire and rot. Let's, you know, this isn't just like mosquitoes. This is like a truly swampy um, waste wasteland type place. So all right, so a 60-foot drop, a misshrouded narrow canyon. Rolling fog conceals a 60-foot drop into um, a, a boggy cave. So let's talk about that cave. Um, how are the characters going to get down there? What character level are we writing for? You, all right, everybody, what character level are we writing for? Let's let the, let's let the chat decide. Um... I want to see what level people want to see this for. Because you guys might be using this in your own game. So what level would you like to see this adventure be for? Four, one, three, three to five, 20. It only goes up to level 10 in Shadow Dark. <laughs> oh, everybody's got one. Let's put it, okay, let's put it at a healthy level. I'm seeing mostly levels one through five in here. Five is a nice even number. Okay, let's put it at let's put it at level five. Um, you know what? Low levels. I'm actually seeing a lot of low levels. Four. Let's put it at three, because that's a good average. I'm seeing a general preference for this being like a an early an early level adventure. Um, so we're putting this at third level. Okay, um, and that'll give us an idea of how dangerous we want to make stuff. Although. Um, you know, danger is still danger in the Shadow Dark, and it's not necessarily leveled. But you want to always have an idea because you don't want to be too mean. You know, you don't you want to put monsters in here that could be, you know, possibly overcome. Some that can't, but the overall vibe is that their level characters should have a fighting chance at this. So that will guide us in our decisions. So a sixty foot drop into a buggy cave would kill most first level third level adventures. Um, sixty six damage if they just fell in splat would be really rough. So. Um, you know, let's, let's think of a way to get the characters in here. Uh, we got ropes, Kelsey doing her residence performance live from Las Vegas. Um, all right, all right. We've got vines growing on the walls. I like that. Vines growing on the walls. Uh, all right, so we've got concealed, uh, deadfall. 
vines, uh, spider webs, slippery slopes, stone steps. I kind of like the stone steps thing because it implies that this was used by people. Uh, but I think they should be slippery, right? Um, and of course, adventurers should have rope with them, shouldn't they? Uh, ooh, evidence of past adventurers, frayed ropes at the top. Oh yeah, frayed ropes, Spanish moss. Um, I'm, let's, let's do a combo of what everybody's suggesting. Uh, all right, we've got, uh, all right, hazard traps, lots of good steps, glowing mushrooms. Um, ancient holy carvings in the wall that have, ooh, that's really cool. That's a cool detail. So now we're starting to talk about not only the uh, ways in, but we're getting some visuals. So ancient, um, oh, wow, ancient dragonfly carvings. All right, I like this. So let's do this. So uh, rolling fog conceals a 60 foot drop into the boggy cave. Um, now, one thing that I like to do is I'm gonna be switching back and forth so much between um, the viewer using because I can't I lost some of my stuff. So, uh, rolling fog conceals a sixty foot drop into a boggy cave. We're gonna we're gonna bold the drop because we're gonna talk more detail about the drop. What we want to encourage in the way that we're writing this um, description is uh, is for the players to ask questions. So we don't want to give them everything right from the start. We don't want to explain that there's tons of ways down right from the start. We want the characters to say, oh, there's a drop. OK, well, we look around. We're looking for a way in. And that's what creates this back and forth between the DM and the players. And that's what we call interactivity. And so any chance you can get to um, offer, offer something in your description that's fair and descriptive but encourages the players to ask questions, that's how you want to frame this stuff. So we've said there's a drop. We know that the, the players are gonna ask questions about the drop, so this is when we're gonna provide some more information for the Game Master. Um, we've got a drop and we decided that, uh, so let's say that a ragged vines um, conceal, or well, we already used the word conceal, so ragged vines cloak a um, wet, narrow set of carved stairs spiraling down to the floor of the cave. Um, and I guess that would give the characters two options here. Um, you know what we could say? A Mr. A, a boggy cave lined in, um, you know, a nest of thick vines. And I want to use, we want to give uh, people options for how they're going to get down there. So we're also going to talk about vines. Um, the vines. All right, uh, let's think of how these vines will work. So the stairs, um, I'm gonna make these into kind of sub, let's see, vines. Uh, uh, oh, wait a minute. Guys, I have way too many, uh, I have way too many um, table styles in here, font styles. Let's see. This is definitely, definitely the wrong size. All right, well, we'll, we'll come back to formatting later. Um, we've got uh, vines and we've got the stairs. We wanna talk about both of these. All right, so let's see what some of our comments are. The vines can come loose, ooh, I like that. Uh, vines have strange flowers or growths, but are harmless. Ooh, I really like that. That's a little bit of like, you know, cloak and dagger. This you, we always want to like give some good stuff and some bad stuff and some stuff that the characters will question. So let's say the vines are, uh, you know, bristling with. Uh, what what color should the flowers be? Um, you know, with uh, flowers of some kinds. <laughs> vines named Angus. Uh, yeah, like, um, ooh, the, ooh, a snake, ooh, a snake in the vines. Blood red, purple, like, okay, let's call purple and blood, and crim we'll say crimson, uh, flowers. Um, why are you doing this font? Oh, Kelsey's workspace? Oh, I have a custom, I have a custom workspace, you all, what the heck? Okay, um, 
wow, that's exciting. Now I can actually, uh, table styles. Nope, nope, nope. Okay. Wow. Why are these a different size? Does this ever bother anybody when they're, when something's a different size? Um, I'm just going to size these down a little bit in their font. I like can't help but lay out while I write. I just have to. Um, and we'll just, uh, okay. There we go. Now everything matches. Neat. Um, laying out while you write, that's a trick Hankerin taught me and it's super smart. So vines are sling with purple and crimson flowers. Um, they break with weight on them. A uh, one in six chance per round. So that just creates a risk, a risk to using the vines to get down. Um, now what else? A oh, waterfall hidden, vines that shoot poison, darts Jumanji style. You know what we should do? Miles Wilson had a cool idea. Um, what happens if the characters eat the flowers? Oh, Miles, Miles, I think that we should uh, have more vines later that do this because. Uh, we want to keep the characters on their toes. So yes, vines now are fine, but vines later, hmm, be scared. Um, water falling down, they fall into the chasm, their smell has a random effect. I like that. Death vine, slippery worn steps. Um, let's see, let's see. We're gonna do stairs. I like the slippery worn steps. Why is this still a different font size? Is it not? I'm just losing it, I'm losing it. Um, okay, slippery worn steps, uh, uh, moving quickly requires DC 12 decks or else fall the rest of the way. Um, so moving quickly, it's a good call out because in Shadow Dark RPG, we always have time as a factor. Um, and so if the characters want to go meticulously, slowly down the stairs, they can and do so safely, but that wastes time. Um, and what that means is that random encounters become likely. So are they being chased right now? Not necessarily, but if they spend three rounds on the stairs instead of one round on the stairs, they have a much more likely chance of a random encounter. Which brings us to the next question. We want to decide about how frequently random encounters occur here. Um, let's use a default of two for now. I'm going to put that in our notes. Um, we'll probably note that later, but a uh, random encounter ever, encounter check every two rounds. Um, bold this so that we know. There we go. Um, awesome. So that way we know that there's some danger coming. Um, okay. So, all right. We've got our first kind of room done, our deadfall. So let's jump back to our map here. Um, and I want us to have the next thing here we need. Um, we need a line. All right, we're going to draw a line. We. Oh, that worked just fine. Then we're going to draw another box. Oh, there we go. All right. We've got another box. So when we get down the deadfall, which is a sort of one-way entrance in, here we go, um, we're going to be at the dungeon proper. So we've got a couple of difficulties getting in, vines and stuff. Um, but the lighting situation, good question. Uh, the lighting situation so far should be whatever the ambient lighting is. But once we get into the complex itself, now we're talking darkness. So... Let's see here. Oh, everybody has such great ideas for the vines. I love these ideas. I want to come back to some of them um, because sometimes uh, space is tight on uh, a single page dungeon layout like we're doing. Also because I want to start to increase the danger as the characters go in. So sometimes it's fun to have a red herring where you're like, oh, the scary vines with the flowers and I'm sure players will be scared to touch them, but then they do and they realize that nothing bad happens. So this will embolden them to touch the vines later. <laughs> And we can uh, do a little bit of bait and switch with that. We don't want to be mean, but we want to make sure we reward characters who are always careful. So we're going to save vine shenanigans for later into the dungeon. Um, okay, now room number two. This is the true entrance to the dungeon, isn't it? Um, if the characters can survive the, uh, the deadfall situation. 
So here we are. I hope you all can see this okay. Um, room number two. Let's think about what we want to do here. We had a concealed entrance. Uh, and now we're moving into the, the abbey itself, right? Uh, which to me speaks to a site that was created at one point by people um, for religious purposes. Um, what do you guys think about that? Could you make one of the dungeon rooms in Arcane Library? Oh, maybe I'll make something like that at some time. Ooh, Evan is suggesting an, a buzzing echo throughout the dungeon. <gasps> That's a great idea, Evan. You know why I really like that is because for each mini dungeon I make, I like to have a special something going on. Whether it's a, a special piece of treasure, a new monster, every dungeon I write is gonna have something like this. Uh, and I think that that gives us something that we could put here. Uh, let me show you what I mean by here. Right here, we've got this little section. So in all my mini dungeons, there's something unique here down in this, this bottom area. Um, I'm wondering if you guys can even see that. There we go. Um, and we've got this little section here for something unique, whether it's like a treasure or a monster. And I want to call this the buzzing. <laughs> so uh, I think that there should be some kind of maddening buzzing going on. I really like this idea. Um, some kind of like, yeah, something that, that attacks the character's perceptions and, and sanity. Um, something that makes them start to maybe lose it a little bit. So um, a buzzing throughout the, throughout the abbey. Um, where, where, I, need, I need access to my text options. There we go. Um, a buzzing throughout the abbey. So we'll say areas two through eight for now. Grows louder over time. Um, characters, why you jump back to the italic like that? Um, PCs uh, must make DC, let's call it a 12 whiz check each time entering a new room, because we want to put some limits on this, or else lose their first action to disorienting. Do we want to say madness? Um, the buzzing makes me <laughs> earplugs. Go silent if the torch goes out. Oh, that's cool. Um, grows louder over time. Piece of well, each time, or else lose their first action to disorienting um, echoes and uh, maddening um, tinnitus. <laughs> um, so this starts to wear on people. And I, the reason we're doing it once each time they enter a new room is because we want people to not be constantly dogged by this, like asking for rolls all the time or every X number of rounds for this would get a little cumbersome. So um, I think that each time they enter a new room, we'd have to see in play testing whether this became too obnoxious, but I think it's a fair number. Um, go silent if torch goes out. I really like that. We're gonna actually figure out um, Throughout, was, okay, so we're gonna actually cut something so we have space for that. Areas two through eight glow, grows louder. Um, uh, so we're just gonna start to cut down into shorthand so we have room that um, over time. Uh, each time entering a new room or lose first action to disorienting echoes. Um, buzzing stops whenever torch or light source goes out. Um, so that would give people a chance to extinguish their torches as they step into a new room. Do they want to do it? Are they run? If they're fleeing, are they going to have to deal with this problem? Interesting. It's an interesting mechanic, and I like it because that increases the eeriness of the buzzing. So we'll probably revisit this to tinker with it some more. But I love that we have like an overall weird effect specific to this dungeon now. Um, so let's come back to our rooms. Okay, we're gonna create room number two. We're gonna put some space in here for that. Um, this is a nothing, this is that. Why? There we go. Um, 
we're gonna just make sure this matches what we want. All right, and there's that. So, okay. Um, oh yeah, this needs to be that. We're gonna put like a little bit of spacing at the end of it maybe. We'll see if we have room for that. Okay, so this is gonna be room number two. All right, we're in the Abbey now. Um, what do you all see when you first come into an Abbey? Fire pit, acid pit. Um, yeah, the buzzing starts only when a torch is lit. I love that. Ooh, it's creepy. Good, good idea, chat. You all are so creative. All right. Um, the, okay, let's see. Um, foyer of offerings. Ooh, that's cool. Some kind of foyer. Yeah, it definitely has to be so, a, a room with like an entrance style vibe. So I like that. And we're going to use that foyer of offerings. Ooh, I love that. Okay. Um, do you know what, can I tell you guys something? Whenever I have one word on a line that takes up an entire line's worth of stuff, I, it really bothers me and then I have to like fix the wording. Um, so we're just gonna say a misty, narrow canyon. Um, we'll come back to that, mist shrouded. Mist shrouded sounds nice though. Um, rolling fog, that's important. We need to know it's along the ground. Uh, conceal a six foot drop into a buggy ham line in a nest of thick vines. It seems fine to me. Um, okay. Foyer, of, is that how you all say it? Do you say foyer or do you say foyer? Foyer of offerings. Don't forget about the inner temple, outer temple, dragonfly wing patterns, square stone fountain pool with dais or altar. Ooh, first of the foyer have carvings and whatnot. Yeah, so there's definitely carvings. Um, so we'll say carvings of, um, ooh, one thing I wanna point out to you all, I have waffled a lot in the style that I use for Shadow Dark's adventure presentation. I don't mean a lot, but um, I, I, I'm I not a big like read aloud text person, as you all know. Um, and I, I like to give a quick image to the game master to convey. So I'm writing for the game master. You know, I'm not writing something for them to read, but everything I put in the first description here is stuff that's safe to share with players whenever I can do it that way. That's what I do because um, I find it very hard for to read something and then try to like pick out what I'm allowed to share and what I'm not. So in this adventure, we're trying to do it that way. And I like to give, you know, um, there have been times where I've been like keyword, like door, you know, moldy, pitted nails, um, and use a very condensed keyword style format. You guys will see that in Curse Scroll 1 and in the Quick Start Guides adventure. Um, but I'm also experimenting with a little more complete sentence style thing because I think that does actually help the game master put something together a bit faster. They're not having to look at keywords and then construct something out of it. They're just reading a sentence and saying, oh, hey, I get this right away. So that's what we're going to do here. Anyhow, this isn't meant to be read out loud. It's meant to be conveyed um, in the game master's own words, which is why we're keeping the language clear and descriptive and evocative and we're not filling it up with all kinds of, uh, you know, phrasing that needs to be said in such a specific way. So let's see what we have. You guys are talking about, ooh, an iron wrought gate with dragonflies. Joshua, I love that. I love the wrought iron feel. It gives it an ancient vibe, um, you know? So I love that, I love that. So we're gonna say, uh, first of all, um, an iron an iron wrought gate um, uh, covers um, a tunnel. Uh, to leading into darkness. Um, so we should say carvings of dragonflies, Ooh, brightly colored dragonfly imagery, um, pseudophanatos press. I agree with you that the comprehension is a thing, bullet points are useful, but they also still have to help you convey information to the game master swiftly. Um, Way of offering should be the end or stopping point for regular visitors. Good call. Um, hidden entrance to the rest of the abbey. Ooh, I like that. So um, offering bowl trap, something must be offered. Should we have the gate, um, should we have the gate conceal some kind of like treasure? Like maybe there's a gate that's been brought down over a shrine to protect the treasures that were left in there. Um, you know, and then something happened that you know, maybe they they shuttered this part of the abbey forever and never reopened it. Um, because I love to put treasure just in sight that requires effort to get and, and makes the characters take risks. Um, 
and, and, and also not something that totally blocks the rest of the way along to the adventure, but yeah, some kind of barrier. Um, so what if we say that the wrought iron gate covers an alcove or, you know, covers an alcove, um, of a, uh, housing a, covers an alcove housing a, um, like some kind of like, what should we do here? Like a fountain or a statue? Um, I'm kind of imagining like an offering bowl that people have put valuables into that was just left to rot, you know? Um, hmm, <laughs> reliquary and a sealed shrine. Yeah, golden idol in an alcove that can be seen from the iron gate with a column fallen inside the alcove. Yeah, like a fallen column, false lock fountain, a dragonfly fountain. I like this idea, you all. I think like housing a um, fountain, you know, housing a cracked stone fountain, um, a, a dragonfly, you know, a life or a, how big, I think like, what if we had a fountain, right? And it was like a big dragonfly carving on the top of it that was sort of ominous, you know, characters are very mistrusting, players are mistrusting of statues. And instead of like water filling the fountain, it's treasures. Um, yeah. Uh, Rust and wear obscure the, ooh, the cruelly inscribed warning done by earlier adventurers. Oh, Magnag Dave, great idea. So I'm going to just steal an indent here. Um, if the characters, so let's let's uh, do this. Uh, blah, we're going to say fountain. Um, so gates, uh, rust hides a warning um, on the gate. When they carve it into the gate, um, yeah, like maybe a, the rust, um, the rust hides a warning carved on, on the gate, and what will it say? We'll come up with that. Uh, um, let's actually have that say the gate. We'll have that be the gate, and then we're gonna have the fountain down here. A uh, fountain. So, um, dragonfly statue. We'll come back to that. So, housing a crackstone fountain. A dragonfly, uh, a carved dragonfly. The size of, it has to be big. Should it be big, you all? Um, this dragonfly statue? Um, like, how big? Like, as big as a horse? Um, yeah, how, cause like it has to be big ish, right? Um, like a big dragonfly statue or is it, yeah. So a huge dragonfly statue, I love to give like a relative size explanation, like as big as a cart, as big as, this, oh, a bison, um, as big as a horse, as big as a, I use horse a lot. That's one of my, that's one of my go-tos. Um, size of an aurochs, wow, of a horse, horsefly. Okay, we'll say, let's say horse, because that's, everybody knows how big a horse is. So, carved dragonfly, the size of a horse, rests atop the fountain. Uh, so we're gonna bold the keywords here. Um, a carved dragonfly. Um, so, we got a gate. Oh man, as big as as big as a horse rests atop the fountain. A wrought iron, is iron wrought? Is it better to say wrought iron? Um, a wrought iron gate uh, blocks an alcove with a cracked stone fountain. Carved dragonfly rests atop the fountain. Um, uh, rust hides a warning carved in the gate. Okay, so fountain. Uh, and then we'll say like, um, so uh, gold glitters inside the bowl of the fountain. Gold, right? Should it be gold? Should it just be, should it just be coins? Um, ooh, the floor is littered with dragonfly wings. Um, ooh, the dragonfly's eyes could be big jewels. I love that. Um, its eyes are glittering gemstones. Um, the dragonfly statue's eyes are two rubies, uh, faceted rubies. Um, they're each gonna be worth, gosh, if you have like big eyeball sized jewels, those gotta be worth something, right? They should each be worth like, oh, they should each be worth like 
a hundred gold pieces, which is a lot in Shadow Dark, because like we want people to grab them. We want people to feel pain at the decision against taking these things, because something bad, of course, has to happen if you mess with an enchanted looking statue. Um, 100 GP each. Um, uh, let's see. Let's actually make the dragonfly statue. Um, its eyes are two. We're gonna make this its own separate thing here. Um, rah, okay, dragonflies, because his eyes are glittering, uh, let's say glittering, uh, we want to say, like, you know, red gemstones, his eyes are faceted, red gemstones, um, two large rubies, okay, uh, or I want to say multi, like, we want to invoke the feeling of a, of a fly's eyes, right, um, if it has an effect, it would think it'd be funny if it has no effect, but the party worries it does. Yeah, you're so right. We did kind of pull that trick just now with the vines and the flowers. So like, we're going to be really setting them up for like betrayal if we do too much of the, like it does nothing. Um, uh, taking the gems excites the buzzing. Uh, ooh, Matt, that's a good idea. Um, the buzzing just makes you lose your action. So it's only scary if there's a threat, you know? So, um... <laughs> hey, Baron's here! Baron, we're making another dungeon! Remember when we did this? We have to finish that one, by the way. Um, Baron and I did this live once, and it was a great setup for this this run right here. Um, praying mantis eyes with a pupil that always looks like it's staring at you. If you take the gem, the water turns acidic. <gasps> it starts to make corrosive mist, Evan. I approve of this message, Evan. I, I, I think Evan has a good idea here, because let's say we've got the gold, right? We've got the gold. Taking the gold, I feel like, should be okay. I feel like it should be a treasure. Like if you get through the gate, which by the way, we haven't decide, um, decided how hard it is. Russ, uh, break DC 12 strength to break open. It's rusted, um, random encounter, but, but very noisy. Um, so this could trigger a random encounter. Um, now, what will, the, what will the warning say? Don't touch the eyes. <laughs> Leave, we'll say leave the eyes, leave the eyes. Um, people who take the time to look are gonna be rewarded for that. So gold glitters inside the bowl of fountain. Um, you know, let's see, let's see. Um, leaving an offering grants a one XP or a luck token. Hey, uh, goal, we're gonna say, um, once per character. You don't wanna turn that into like the, the, the XP train. Um, but taking the gold gives you, uh, taking it, there's 200, there, we're gonna, let, let's say there's 100 GP total. Leaving a gold gold offering grants one XP or a luck token once we're busy taking it, 100 GP total. Um, so, all right. Characters have a choice here. They want to take the gold, safer bet, less treasure. We want to tell them, but hey, those eyes are really sparkly and nice. So, dragonfly statue. Um, taking them turn turns gold into caustic acid. Uh, how do we want to do this? Um, taking gold DC against buzzing increases. Ooh, that could work too. I'm still like, how are we going to put this buzzing into effect, right? Because it causes you to lose your action. Uh, we need to pair it with something to make it dangerous, you know? Like there needs to be a, a, a creature somewhere or like a surprise attack or a trap that triggers. Like wouldn't it be scary if you walked into a room and a trap triggered and you lost your action due to the buzzing right there? You'd be like, well, you just start drowning in the water. Um, they don't, don't touch the eyes, they. Uh, the eyes are. Ah, you know, it's too vague. Leave the eyes. Um, 
I do want to reward people who are smart enough to leave the eyes and find that. Yeah, because I don't want to be like, don't touch the, and then cut it off, because then it's kind of, yeah, maybe it could be, maybe it should be that. Don't touch the, because it gives them, a, it tells the characters, hey, there's something in here you shouldn't touch. You have to figure out what it is. Don't touch the, um, hides a, a warning. Rust hides a warning card down to the gate. Uh, a broken warning carved, um, faint, we'll just say a faint broken warning, broken warning carved under the gate, don't touch the, all right, so they know that to touch something, they'll have to decide, make a judgment call about what that is, um, DC strains to break open, but very noisy, um, gold glitters, blah, blah, blah. okay, so taking the, the rubies, um, Turns gold into caustic acid. Um, we got to make this acid do something mean. Look at the eyes. May have been removed before. Looks like the eyes may have been removed before. True. True. Do not blind. Puzz buzzing causes disadvantage on decks. Yeah, let's not make the warning a riddle. That's for Fae and Fiends. Hmm. I kind of like Ryan's idea too that uh, causes the gold to melt um, or like causes the statue to blast acid. Um, the rubies were keeping the acid in. Yeah. Yeah, let's see here. Melts all coins touching them, placing gold coins into the fountain disables the acid. Um, damages equipment. Oh, I love that idea. Damages equipment. We need to attack the gear more often than we do. We're always attacking the hit points. We're always attacking the spell casting resources. Sometimes you just gotta attack the gear. Shadow Dark's got limited gear in it. Man, it would be great to have a torch just get melted. Um, uh, any stored gold destroys 1d4 carried items. Uh, I love that. Um, Turns any stored gold destroys 1d4 carried items. Uh, holding causes 1d4 damage around. Uh, all right. Its eyes are two large rubies. Taking them turns gold into. Um, I, I think acid is uh, caustic by nature. Stored gold destroys 1d4 carried items. Touching it causes 1d4 damage per round. So if they're like holding it, they're like, ah, I'm burned. Or if they've already scooped gold into their backpack, it annihilates 1d4 items, um, which is fun. So I love that. Uh, let's see, inspired by dark souls with corrosion. Very cool. Uh, dragonflies swarm out of the empty eye sockets. I like all that. I like that there's like a passive curse on it um, that, that kind of, you know, it's like leave, leave, the, leave the eyes alone. Um, all right, let's leave it there for then, a foyer of offerings. Um, all right, now, we oftentimes don't need to mention when there is a, uh, oops, when there is a, a, a set of doors leading out of a place. Um, I think that like mentioning that in your description is a little bit unnecessary because we already can see that from the map and if the characters ask it is simple to tell them. Um, so I'm not gonna, I don't, I'm not gonna say in our descriptions like, um, actually I'm gonna shorten this. I'm not gonna say in our descriptions, you know, there's a door to the west, a door to the east, you know, all that kind of stuff. Cause we don't really need to, we'll just rely on the dungeon master to convey that by looking at the map. And that saves us a lot of space in our layout and description. So I want to have two rooms branching off of here, right? Because every good dungeon needs a, a choice in paths. So let's move on to another room or two. Um, I'm going to make us another box. Uh, where are you, box? There you are. Um, we got a room here. We got a room here. Um, and right away, this will give characters some branching paths to pursue, which is always a good thing to do in an old school dungeon. Um, so let's call this room three and let's call this one room four. All right. So hopefully you guys can kind of see what I'm doing here. I just want to zoom out a little bit. So hopefully this all fills the screen. Um, so we've got some branching paths. 
Now, uh, oh, I'm so, oh, some of you, yay, some of you have been filling out your surveys throughout this. That makes me very happy. Um, Evan is asking if we can put some verticality in one of these. Absolutely. What do you all think? Like, should we do same floor stairs? Um, should we do, uh, like actual scaling of walls? I don't know if we're going to be able to do multiple levels, like true levels, but we can add a section of this dungeon that's more elevated or more de-elevated than the others. Um, yeah, we've got a Jockey's the room, Jock, Jock, hey, you know, Janelle herself told me that it should be pronounced Jock, Jockey's, I believe, or Jock, yeah. Um, but I don't think anyone pronounces it that way. Uh, but we shall see. So a single upper level says I have terrible rolls. Climbing a tall wall would work. I love the idea that there's verticality here because uh, whatever dragonflies live inside can fly. So um, making the characters feel that as they're exploring, like, oh, if only you could fly, <laughs> you'd be able to navigate this much better, um, would be kind of fun, right? So... There should be a room with a vertical shaft leading out of the top of the dungeon where the dragonflies fly in and out. I think that would be very cool. Yes. Oh, Steve Burnett, hello. Um, that would be very cool. Another way in and out, for sure. Um, like a shelf up near the top with hidden treasure. Yeah, super cool. I, oh, I like that. I love hidden treasure. Who doesn't love hidden treasure? Um, mezzanine where foes can snipe from. Ooh. So here's a question. This brings us to, because now we're coming into some new rooms. We've done a trap room. We've done a kind of a, uh, I mean... I, I want to say like a physical barricade room was the first room. We've, we've got a bit of a trap going on in here. Um, we haven't done any combats. So we haven't done any like NPC interactions, but like who lives here? Who lives here? Oh, dream big, build small. You didn't miss out on the Kickstarter. I just reopened it for late pledges today. So you can go right over to the Kickstarter and pledge right now if you want to. I'm going to have that open for um, several weeks. So... Um, yeah, I should have said that from the start. If you want to pledge for Shadow Dark RPG, you still can. Late pledges are open. Anyhow, let's 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 decide who lives in here. Do we have uh, what is it? Surely people who have either lived here for a long time or were trapped here, bug men, immortals of some kind, uh, things that that can carry on without uh, contact with the outside world, um, mummified monk corpse. Oh, a frog hermit. Nice. <laughs> Cultists that have mutated into dragonfly men. Always a classic. Frog men. Love it. Um, swamp druid. Mushroom folk. Wow, so many good ideas. I'm getting swampy vibes. Frog folk that harvest the dragonflies. True. But I feel like the dragonflies feel sacred to me in this. You know, they're given a... We're already seeing that they're given sort of a, a fancy place of note on the on the fountain so um having them simply be a source of food seems like it might be like um you know not not quite it not quite it mosquito folk magic frogs i love frogs i love frog guys um i have a thought okay so based on what you guys are saying yeah maybe maybe this was once the glorious place of like the dragonfly beings or cultists but maybe some frog guys moved in here and took it over and yeah, now maybe they're using the glorious dragonflies here as a source of like food, um, you know, and they're, they've, they've invaded. And maybe this even gives us the opportunity for multiple mini, mini factions in here because we've got the original dragonfly guys who are like, hey, stop touching our dragonflies. And then you've got the invading, invading frog guys who are like, this is our temple now. We're going we're gonna to turn this into like our, you know, dragonfly snack zone and we're going to take it over and stay here. So... Um, I'm going to add this to our notes because I, I really love, even in a small place, incorporating factions. So um, let's see, we've got some, we've got a faction of faction invading frog men eat dragonflies. Um, and then we've got a faction uh, original dragonfly worshippers. And then we're going to have their mode to be stop eating our dragonflies, retake Abby. And this guy's mission is going to be eat dragonflies, keep hold of Abby. So I'm just going to bold these so that we know that we have some faction information here. Um, hopefully you guys can all see this screen pretty okay. Um, so... 
I like this, the, the hypnotoad, sting bats. Um, so frogmen, in honor of Hanker and Fernail, who's the frogman master, I want to throw some frogmen in here. Um, so then what do we have in rooms three and four? Now, the, don't, don't pay much attention to how big the rooms are. We're, we, we can make them fit the relative size based on what we decide. But the frogmen from, are from the grotto area that leads to a swampy area on the other side of the abbey. Yeah, yeah, I feel like the frogs came in from, from the surrounding swamplands, right? Um, froggy snipers. So I bet that the frogmen in here do not assume that anyone but them are going to be entering. So they probably are not like guarding the entrances. Like, nah, this place is too concealed. Um, <laughs> oh, Scott sent some frogs. Oh yeah, Scott, wait, weren't there frogs that like ate things in backpacks? Or am I getting that confused with the cool ooze that you, just, that you created? Um, and then we've got the dragonfly dudes who I bet are gonna be pushed farther back into the farthest reaches or even secret places of this abbey as they're trying to figure out a plan to retake the abbey from the invading frogmen. So I think we're coming in right in the midst of a faction war. Um, so we have got poisonous frogmen with poisonous arrows. I love it. Frogmen entered through tunnels. Verticality could be down under the water in the toad area. Awesome. All good stuff. So um, dragonflies are raised like cattle by the frogmen. Yeah. All right. So. I think we need to immediately start showing this faction war at play. And in my opinion, that means showing a situation where the frogmen have taken over. And I think that the room to the north, room number three, should be a dragonfly hatchery. Um, so we want to start showing right away that something's kind of kind of not normal here. So, um, so we've got a, we're going to call this room three, dragonfly hatchery. Um, and I think that this is, uh, and you guys tell me what you think about this. Some kind of like, yeah, the frog larder, basically. This was once a sacred room, perhaps even, okay, like maybe like a pond of some kind. Um, like a, a big, well-kept pond area where, you know, dragonfly are hatching. But the frogmen are now just splashing around in here having a buffet anytime they get hungry. Um, so... We are gonna we're gonna say that we have like a um, you know like a arched passage opens into a high room um, with a with a green um, what is a what is a pond what does a pond smell like like what do you for what first hits you when you walk into this room? You see a pond, right? And I, I think it is going to be a big open room that's sort of bursting with vegetation, um, like a <laughs> the sacred pond has been turned into a frog spa, um, mosaic light puzzle, colors for nest. Uh, oh, Chris Johnson, this is for level three. We've decided we're going to do level three characters for this. Moldy, stagnant. Yeah, yeah, icky, decaying vegetation. But could this also be sort of a bit of a secret garden? Like, it's going to be smelly and old, but are these dragonfly people, like, bad guys? Or were they the good guys that were just hiding out here cultivating these, like, beautiful dragonflies? Like, and then, um, and then the frog people invaded. Um, definitely, like, moldy petrichor. Yeah, petrichor. Joseph, that's the smell that I was thinking, petrichor. Like, the smell of rain or the smell of wetness on stone. Um, so, you know, I'm not sure everybody's gonna know what petrichor is with a, with, with a green pond that, that smells of water on stone. I think if we say that, most people are gonna know what we mean. Um, and with a green, should we say a glassy? Um, algae covered? Or should we say, do dragonflies like algae and stuff? Do they like stinky ponds? Glassy, moss-choked pond that smells of water. We'll say algae-choked algae. Is it AE? That smells of water on stone. Um, wet stone. Rain on stone. What's the best way to describe this? You really want to get. You really want people to catch like just something 
stands out right away from your description to people. That smells like rain on stone. I think everybody knows what that smell is. That's petrichor. I learned recently that humans can smell petrichor, um, that, that smell of rain um, on the ground, with more precision and strength than sharks can smell blood and water. It's actually one of the smells that humans are most tuned to smell. And I'm not sure people really, biologists, I don't know if there's a theory as to why. But if that's true, I think that's really cool. So, um, insects prefer standing water. Yes, okay, dream big, build small, thank you. Good to know, yeah, they do, they do. Um, uh, the humidity is overwhelming. Um, and now, it, yeah, it's, oh, it's, yeah. Uh, into a high room with a glassy edge of the smells, um, you know, uh, humidity uh, collects on the walls. All right. Uh, pond. So we're going to bold the word pond because I feel like that's going to be an important word. Um, high room with a glassy audio choke pond that smells right. Uh, we do want to, we do want to say that, okay, so um, there are probably frogmen in here. Oh yeah, we need to describe, you know what, let's, um, let's describe the dragonflies actually. So uh, iridescent dragonflies uh, uh, you know, dip and uh, dip and buzz. What do they do? What do? How do dragonflies fly? They kind of whirl. They kind of like scoot around suddenly. Um, um, they flit. Yes, Eric. They do. They flit. Uh, yeah. Uh, iridescent dragonflies flit and frolic. I like this because you know what we're doing here with this language is we're making them seem like pretty and innocent and oh the beautiful dragonflies um flit and frolic over the water um now i think that we need to have some frog dudes like somewhere um frogmen faint bro <laughs> oh it was funny when you copy paste and you don't know what you're gonna get um so okay so frogmen are the frogmen desecrating? I think they're, okay. Frogs like to just chill in the water, right? Don't they, for the most part? So I feel like the frogmen are like fat and sleepy and I feel like they're drifting around in the water with just their snouts above the water. So I feel like they're kind of hidden. Croakmen. Fly, tender frog. Um, so why are offerings being left to begin with? We'll have to, yeah. Good question. We'll have to answer that later. So two frogmen resting. Um, so two, so uh, two frogmen. Or actually, you know what? Let's make this an actual. Like, let's make it an encounter. Let's say like a uh, four frogmen. Well, should we make it an encounter? Like enough to have enough to 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 have a good fight, or enough to have the frogmen be like, oh no, we're overwhelmed and we need to negotiate. Um, yeah, y'all, how do we want to pitch this? Do we want the frogmen, do we want this just to be a, like, here's a fight? Or do we want it to be like the frogmen know that they're outclassed and so they need to, they need to uh, either negotiate with the characters or flee? Um, yeah, like an NPC encounter. Um, Intro, no combat, learn of the frogmen I'm seeing. Can we have a vine snake encounter for sure? Yeah. Yeah, vine snakes. You know what we should do? We should add like vine snakes to the random encounter table. So um, now, just thinking of that quick, I'm just going to jump us back quick while we think of it. So um, so we'll say a vine snake cobra falls from above. Yeah, snakes are good. Snakes definitely fit the vibe. Okay, now our frogmen. Back to our frogmen. So, um, yeah. I, I kind of like the idea of it being an NPC encounter, right? Because they can parlay. And then the characters can decide. Do they want to join with a faction? Like, I, I don't want to always make... Like, you know, you don't want to make stuff just like a stand-up fight. Especially not in old school D&D where we're talking about reaction roles. Um, where we're, we're... The reaction role is going to determine what this is. And I think that making two lazy frogmen who just had a bunch of snacks have a disadvantage in this encounter seems to make sense to me. I mean, you know, they're just here, they're just here for the buffet. They're not guarding or anything. So, um, so, uh, so four frog, or let's say that this is two frogmen and, 
uh, overly full on dragonflies. Um, two frogmen floating just below surface. Um, I don't necessarily want to pitch them as hiding because they're not. They're just being frogs. So if someone so if someone looks carefully at the surface of the water, they'll see these shapes. Um, this is a, we're auto success. We're being generous with information. Um, one of the tenets of Shadow Dark RPG is you know one of the core ethos, which I talk about at the beginning of the uh, of the um, book here. Let me see if I can actually see what I'm showing you guys. So we've got core ethos, and one of them is a uh, Boop, 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 information, information. We're not withholding crucial information about forwarding encounters and ex exploration and room stuff from the characters behind checks. Checks are not for that. Checks are for active actions that are under time pressure and need a good result. So I'm not gonna hide the, the, the frogs below the surface of the water behind a wisdom check or some form of perception check because um, it, that information is the reward for looking. And you want to reward looking. You don't want the characters to look around and then get to trigger a roll. You want to be like, hey, you took the time to investigate this. That was very smart of you. Here's some information. So this is what we're going to do. Um, all right, we've got our frogman. Let's check the chat. How deep is the water? Good question, Dirt. Good to see you, by the way. We got to play in an adventure the other day. Um, just below the surface. Uh, so the pond, you know what? Yeah, we need... Um, we might need to, we're already running out of space. Um, urge by everyone, glassy audio choke pond. So we're gonna say pond. Uh, how deep is the pond? Like 10 feet deep? Ponds are not that deep. At the center, it's probably about 10 feet at the most. Um, I'm gonna indent these frogmen. You know what? I like to put the really like critical information first. So we're gonna actually describe the pond second. If the DM needs to know that, they'll glance down. Um, just below pond's surface, surface, overly full on dragonflies, uh, shocked at, shocked at newcomers. Um, treasure here is something that the croak, the croak folk, I love calling them croak folk. Um, particularly, yeah, Jonathan, I'm learning the habit of rolling for info. If you do something that deserves information, if you open the drawer, you don't have to roll perception to see what's in the drawer. If, uh, you know, if you look at, if you look at the sky, you don't have to roll perception to see what's in the sky. You, you just see what's there. Um, yeah, make it a grotto so it's deeper. Yeah, I, I think six feet, hmm, there should be some treasure in this pond, right? Yeah, croak folk equals brilliant. We're calling them croak folk going forward. <laughs> Two croak folk floating just below pond's surface. Overly full on dragonflies, shocked at newcomers. Um, so we'll, we'll provide stats for frog dudes somewhere. Um, and that way we won't have to, you know, re-describe everything. Um, pond, let's say the pond is, let's say the pond is 15 feet deep at center. Bowl shaped. Um, and what's gonna be in there? There has to be treasure in the pond, right? Treasure at the bottom, what should we put in there? Mud layer at the bottom for rough terrain. Um, do the frogmen care about the treasure? Joseph, good question, do they know about the treasure? Are they too obsessed with the dragonflies? Um, amber in the water. Maybe there's something in this water, like something that's, that's, really cool that's um a magic magic item or something like if the characters bother to go look down at the bottom like this seems like a good place for some sacred relic to have been placed long ago um ooh, crashed vehicle dragonfly control item like a wand a silvered weapon um hmm water filter Ooh, does the pond have an underwater tunnel that's a really good thought um shellfish pearls scepter hmm maybe we need a roll table for this let's like let's let's see if we can like roll up something kind of weird that's cool you know and if it doesn't work it doesn't work but we at least this has given us some ideas so i'm actually turning to let's see um hmm magic item generator let's see so shadow dark rpg we're gonna let's come up with like a weird utility item so that's gonna be page 90 of shadow dark rpg so chat roll me a d20 and we'll make this fit the dragonfly theme if we need to. 
Um, who rolled me the d20 first? I'm, I'm probably behind the actual chat here. 14! A helm. Okay. And the next thing, a 17, a helm that hums quiet, sweet tones. I love it. I'm going to write this down. A helm that hums quiet, sweet tones. This really fits with the buzzing. Um, so we're going to say magic item. Helm that hums quiet, sweet tones. Um, let's think what else this thing does. So what's a cool benefit that it can have? Um, yeah, it has, it has to be a helm with like dragonflies. It has to. Um, helm with dragon eyes. It hums quiet, sweet tones. Um, all right. Somebody roll me a d12. The helm of humming. That's what it has to be. And I think it definitely negates the effects of the buzzing. Um, who rolled me a d12? Zion Kurt, good to see you in the chat, my guy. Um, all right, so four for the benefit is once per day teleported near distance. That's kind of cool. I think once per day, so let's riff on that, right? Because it's dragonflies. So once per day, it should let you fly in your distance. And you fly like making a weird buzzing sound like a hummingbird. Or I mean a hummingbird, a dragonfly. Um, so once per day, fly in your distance. Um, so once per day, fly in near distance. Immune to buzzing while wearing. Let's also give it a plus one armor class when you're wearing it. Um, you know, it gives you, it gives you a cool benefit, a, a boost armor class. Um, this is so cool. <laughs> thank you. Oh, oh, thank you. JP, it's fun. Yeah, you know, it's super fun to use these roll tables and, and definitely when you're using them, riff on them, you know, like if you get an, a, a, something that uh, sort of fits what you're going for and you want it to be themed in some way, just change it slightly. You know, that teleport thing we just changed to flying and now suddenly it's a dragonfly home. So, um, all right, so that was page 291. I think we will not put a curse on it. We could, but I don't think we will for this because it's just, we want to make something that's beneficial and fun. So, um, all right. Or instead of flying, can it summon a dragonfly mount? Ooh, Scott, good idea. We should do that later. Um, what incentive do the PCs have to go beyond the statue with rubies and gold in the fountain? More treasure. More treasure. There's always, the incentive is always more treasure um, because that's how you get XP. <laughs> So we're gonna call this the, what, what did we call it? The Helm of Humming? What, what did chat call it back up there? Um, the Helm of Humming, Helm of Humming. Helm of, all right, Helm of Humming. This is cool, so uh, buried in the muck. We'll say Helm of Humming at bottom. Uh, we're gonna get rid of bowl shape because I think that's sort of implied with the pond. Um, and I'll, you know, I'll figure out a way to fit the rest of the um, uh, Helm of Humming in mud at bottom. Uh, we'll, we'll publish either a document on the side with the, with the croak folk stats and the Helm of Humming stats, you know? Um, Cause usually like when I'm writing a, a one page, uh, or, you know, like I guess this is kind of a one page dungeon. I would typically use already existing stuff so that we're not having to like put in a bunch of new material that's taking up layout space, but this is special. So we're gonna include a separate document with stats and magic items um, just to give us more layout space and because we're coming up with so many unique ideas here. So, um, all right, we've got the helm of, uh, the hum of helming. <laughs> the helm is part of a set. All right, so croak folk have adverse effects to loud buzzing, maybe. I feel like croak folk already croak and buzz so i wonder if in fact i wonder if it might even be the opposite because they're so used to being around bugs and dragonflies and swampy stuff i wonder if they're unaffected by this um oh mountain biker 78 how to decide what to bold versus what to italics uh, i use bolding um for important keywords that i'm going to talk about later usually um like in the gm subtext and I will often italicize, uh, I always italicize um, magic items. In Shadow Dark, I capitalize them if they're specifically named magic items, like the Helm of Humming. Um, and I, I italicize spells um, so that people know that I'm not saying, like, you know, I cast, or, you know, if I'm using something that, that could be otherwise mistaken as an ordinary word, when it's a spell, it helps to italicize it so that people know, oh, that's not actually just an ordinary word. So. Um, croaking offsets the buzzing. Yes, Jake, I think you are so right. And I'm gonna put that, I'm gonna put a note in here that, um, so we have our croak folk um, invading croak folk 
frog men um, immune to buzzing because they croak. Um, yeah, and we're gonna do the helm of humming. Um, we'll design that as well. So, all right, so we're, we're already on room three now. I don't know what else we need to explain about this room because, um, well, because first of all, I hate breaking things over a line, like over a column like this, so I wanna keep it to, to just this, but I think that the croak folk are the main attraction here, and so the, the, the PZs are gonna spend uh, their, their encounter interacting with them. So let's, let's see what else we can do here. Um, all right, we're gonna do Number four, room four. What is it gonna be? Let's see what we have. I'm just like setting us back to sort of a template style for everything. Um, let's look at our map. Sorry, uh -huh. gotta get the template right before you can write, right? You gotta, you gotta get that template on point. So here's what we have so far. I wanna make sure you guys can see this as I'm scrolling around. Um, I was kind of setting up number four right here, but let's jump back to our map. Um, I liked the idea of there being like a secret tunnel of some kind from from the bottom of the pond leading somewhere. So we don't we don't need to say where yet, but we'll just do that for now. So that leads somewhere. Um, but room four in our abbey. Room four. An old altar room, prayer room, ruined by the crow folk, desecrated altar. Yeah, I think it's time for an altar. All right, yeah, an inner sanctum. Let's call this. Let's call this an inner sanctum. That's a great thought. So it'll be sort of a. Um, we're gonna say inner sanctum. We definitely need an altar of some kind. And we definitely. I bet there will be crow folk present. What about them, we don't know, but you definitely think in the inner sanctum that the crow folk have taken over. They definitely have to be there, right? Um, so probably taken over by the frog guys. Secret tunnel. <laughs> One room needs a grappling hook to access. Ooh, really interesting thought. I remember we were talking about verticality, so we should say maybe it requires a sheer climb. There are no stairs like a sheer climb up to this room because this is a natural defense mechanism for the room. Um, the dragonfly cultists or dudes or whatever can, can climb. And I bet the croak folk have sticky fingers and can climb pretty easily. So it's really just gonna be the PCs who are at a disadvantage here. Um, but I think maybe this is also why frogmen, we're gonna say sticky fingers for climbing. They're kind of like, you know, tree frogs. Um, yeah, and you could use the new humming helm to fly up, which would be great if you found it. So that's just a really nice little callback. So we're gonna say um, a 30 foot uh, uh, sheer wall or like a sheer uh, sheer pass. Why does it keep holding? Stop it, stop it. Um, sheer uh, wall leads up to a room with an altar we, we could we could do much better than that but um sheer wall or sheer tunnel right would that make sense um i'm imagining this is like a, basically like a kind of like tunnel shaft and you can see the lip of the room up above um leads up to a ledge uh, leads up to a ledge. Um, uh, beyond it. Do we want to save this information in, for the GM stuff? Because the characters aren't going to see this right away. Um, there is too much spacing. All right, so... Um, we're gonna, yeah, we're gonna do, um, like a, well, all of my formatting is wrong. This needs to be size nine with 13 letting. Eh. There we go. I have to. 
I have to fix this. I don't know why it's actually not. Um... No, now you guys get to see me struggle with, uh, with InDesign for a minute. So what I'm doing here is I've set up textiles in InDesign um, where you can just, you know, everything that's set to that style, if you change that style, it will change all of the text across the board, which is a great feature for them usually, you know, but um, sometimes it, it gets in your way. So, all right, so we're gonna say alter room, room with an alter. See how creative we are when we're drafting? Um, okay. So you all, back to the chat here. Um, the, the cult was cloistered here. Um, some kind of pyre, it's like a chimney. Yeah, it's like a chimney, like shaft equals tunnel. Yeah, so um, yeah, like a uh, sheer shaft leads up to a ledge. Um, a ledge leads to uh, um, Uh, so beyond ledge, um, let's describe our altar room like you all said. So yeah, dragonflies can fly up and down, no problem. Um, spherical room, Santa, should we have like a dead croak folk just lying at the bottom here? Like he slipped and fell or something and it, it gives people a... Yeah, let's have like, like, like let's have a dead croak folk because that gives some information about what's to come for people who didn't go north. Um, but then again, why would they just leave the dead body of someone laying there? I mean, are the croak folk really that vile? They're bad guys, right? They don't care. Yeah, they're bad guys. So, um, body of a frog-like um, man lies twisted at the bottom. And we're gonna talk about that body. Um, so, uh, looted. <laughs> Your friends just looted him. <laughs> Should we say that there's a one in six chance of hidden, of missed treasure? Roll on um, levels one through three table. So they, I don't know, it's kind of fun for there to be a chance that treasure was uh, was left behind if someone decides to like investigate this guy's body. Um, it's always fun to make it be a chance. Uh, already. We'll just say looted. Um, beyond ledge, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put anything that's, uh, you know, in the altar room, which is this stuff. Um, if y'all can see this, hopefully, let me double check. I'm gonna put like the, the this stuff on a deeper indent because this is all stuff that's inside the altar room. Um, so let's do that second indent and we're gonna put this as a second indent. Um, that kind of helps us uh, know that that stuff's specific to the altar room. Um, beyond ledge, how will we describe the altar room? Let's Okay, let's jump back to chat. We're finally at the point where we're gonna describe what's in this altar room. How do we envision this? Um, uh, something ate its legs, a helm worth one or three XP. Oh, Forrest, good question. Um, a magic helm, that is probably something, you know, I would leave it up to the GM. I would probably give three XP for it because it's hard to find and it's pretty cool and unique. So I think it's pretty fabulous. Um, so I'd probably give three XP for it. You could argue that it's worth one though because it's nothing, it's nothing like, you know, earth shattering, but, um, I would leave that up to the game master, and, and, and honestly, maybe a little bit of, depending on how much effort it took the characters to find it, it might have felt much, much more important than it actually is, and that might be a situation in which you do want to award a little more XP if the characters put in just an enormous amount of resources to get to it, so um, that's why XP is ever so slightly relative in this game. Um, sometimes it's a little more contextual than you think, so um, yeah, no, good, good question, good question. It's always worth explaining the mentality behind that. Um, Something with good or acoustics, um, enchanted wood. So now remember y'all, the buzzing. The buzzing is gonna surge up as the characters enter this room and if there's bad guys in here, that could be really bad for them. So um, especially when the person with the helm flies up and is like, I'm fine. 
and then pulls their friends up and you know get, gets a grappling hook going and then suddenly all the friends like fall to their knees or fall off the ledge because they crawled over and just get hit by this buzzing you know um so uh what do we see we see an altar covered in vine and dried flowers Ooh, thank you Hampshire. so um beyond ledge um uh we're gonna see uh it has to be tall because we're talking about flying things so a tall well tall is kind of a boring word we're gonna say like an airy room with um uh with a prominent altar covered in vines um how do how would the shire um vines and dried flowers with a prominent what is the what is the material of the altar do we want to save that for the description of it yeah so what is the material um we also need to mention the vines what do they do vines um but the altar is and oh yeah and then um you know what beyond there's an airy room uh, sits at the rear. Beyond the ledge, airy room with because we're gonna actually describe. So oftentimes we'll want to describe the most important or significant thing first when they when the characters enter a room, and this can be difficult, right? Because you're trying to give them an idea of what they see, and oftentimes when a game master is describing something, it's sometimes nice to end on a note of like, and here is the most important thing. You know it. When I'm saying, like, you enter, like, a large room with a pond, in the pond or four frogmen, you know, there's actually immediacy to what I last mentioned. So there, there's an argument in the design community that you always want to put the most important information first, which is kind of true, but I think that there are times, too, when, when if all of it is condensed well enough so that the game master is basically getting it all at once, it actually offers a little bit of uh, pacing to the description when you're like, Imagine yourselves entering this tall, airy room, you know, you feel the cold humidity inside here, and then before you are the frogmen. Like, the frogmen are the thing that are going to stand out the most. It's the thing you last mentioned, and therefore it's actually most fresh in the character's mind. So I've always, I've always been skeptical of that argument that you should only put the most informa important information first when you know that the game master is actually going to probably describe this in reverse order to the characters and leave them with the last thing they said as the most recent and prominent. Anyway. Strange theories from a strange person. So, um, so, but we will mention the frogmen first. So, beyond the legendary room with, um, with, ooh, I love what the chat's talking about with like amber with a giant. Oh, yeah, should it be, should it be like the entire altar should be made of amber with a dragonfly, like a big dragonfly encased in it? And it's, yeah, ooh, and it's the source of the buzzing. Ooh, I love this. I love this. So altar is, uh, you know, dark, um, glossy amber um, with a, how big should the dragonfly be? Here we go again. I'm always like, how big should it be? <laughs> is it horse sized? <laughs> um, with an ancient, with an ancient uh bottle green a uh, dragonfly encased in it uh da -da. is bottle green like the right word we want no that's too boring iridescence way cooler um uh glossy amber we don't even need to say dark we know amber is a bit dark and opaque with an ancient uh with an ancient dragonfly encased in it um is it like a cat sized dragon size, like large dog? Let's say like a, with an ancient cat size. Let's say cat size, because that would still be scary. I mean, if you were like out in the street and you saw a cat sized dragonfly flying at you, you, you would be like, I am under attack. <laughs> this isn't right. Something's wrong. <laughs> um, dragonfly encased in it. Um, so, uh, should the vines once again just be like, descriptive airy room with prominent altar carved in covered in vines and dried floweries uh an airy room with oh yeah sorry with uh okay this, we're gonna add the crow folk in here um with like let's say like four um toad men uh 
I, I'm always torn between when we have such limited space if we're actually going to describe what the monsters look like. I think we should if we can. You know, it's better to describe what they look like than to just be like, it's a sturge or a sting bat. It's better to be like a flapping orange beast with a long beak. Um, so, uh, uh, mm-hmm. With, uh, we'll just say with, like with, uh, wet, with four, um, damp damp what like what what skinned frog like men with four uh frog headed headed men or women people a uh, prom oh with four frog headed people um with four frog headed people what are they doing what are the monsters doing um Languid Batrakians. <laughs> I would normally say folk, but I don't want the dungeon master to think I'm accidentally referencing a monster that already exists. I want it to like be clear that it's a description of their appearance. Um, and when you put folk on the end of something, it immediately sounds like a monster. Um, cultus. Oh, yes, definitely cultus. Leathery, moist, dark. Oh, I love it. Leathery, moist, dark green. Um, you know what? I have to... Okay, we're going to... like. Tony, great call. I'm gonna I'm gonna actually use that in the description we use of the um descript. Cause like whenever we make a new monster, we wanna give a brief description of what they look like. So um frog headed people. Cause I don't know if we have enough room here, although maybe we do. Um let me look at here. Let me look here. Um with four leathery moist <laughs> four <laughs> Huh. For leathery, I'm gonna say leathery, right? Because I feel like we can fit that in there. Um, mm hmm. Leads up to ledge, beyond ledge, airy room for leathery frog headed people um, lounging around on reed mats. They're lounging, they're terrible. Um, uh, blobular. <laughs> Joseph Blobular, I love it. Um, can they be gambling? Of course they're gam yeah, they're gambling. Um yeah, because these are some these are some low level bad dudes for uh croak folk. Gambling using uh what 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 would croak folk use to gamble? It ain't just dice. It's gotta be something weird, something froggy. Um uh, you know, gambling with uh slimy glass beads. They use glass beads. Playing with slimy glass beads. That's that seems what they would do. Um, they kind of look like eggs or something. Um, and uh, does amber burn? I suppose it would. It's kind of like a yeah. That makes sense. Um, gambling using flies. I know. That'd be funny if they're just eating bags of, of flies of, you know, or if they each have a jar of flies that they're swigging out of or something. Um, uh, with slimy glass beads and swigging out of jar of jars of dead flies. <laughs> Gross. Uh, it reminds me of that frog episode from Raymond. Um... <laughs> Such a good, such, such, like, literally one of the best twists of all time. Um, okay. So, uh, yeah, it's swinging out of jars of, of dead fly juice. Ugh. Gambling. We could just say that they're gambling. That's a little more active. Uh, with slimy glass beads and swinging out of jars of dead flies in swamp water. They're drinking it, and there's like, you know, do you guys remember those drinks, like those Orbitz drinks from the 90s that had like, it was like liquid with those like orange beads you could drink that were suspended in it, and now I don't think you could buy it because it was probably like very bad for you or something. Um, that, Croak Folk Juice. Yeah, they're playing D&D, &D, duh. <laughs> um, 
So th they're there. The altar. What is the dry? Okay, so we've got them. There's going to be a reaction roll when the characters come in. Uh, maybe they'll be accompanied by their new croak folk allies from the prior rooms, or maybe they'll be like, no, we're we're enemies, and so they'll they'll want to uh, fight. So we're going to let the, the the systems of Shadow Dark decide what they do in this room, um, and we're going to let some of the background information we write uh, on you know that we'll cook up for the prior page, uh, contextualize this for the game master. So they'll know what's going on. They'll know why the crow folk are here. And then we're going to let the dice decide how this encounter plays out for the characters. Um, so we don't need to over-describe that, but what does the altar do? That's my next big question. Um, <laughs> oh, you still have an Orbitz bottle on your shelf, Lucky Di Diabolical? Does it still have the, is it still like unopened and everything? Or, because uh, <laughs> that would be wild. Um, so what does the altar do? Uh, we had talked about this a bit. The vines are gonna just the vines are gonna just be uh, some some window dressing because I don't know if we're gonna have room to describe it at you know massively um, for you know and we're gonna be limited by the amount of room we have so this might even be a, a, a you know a, a very classic five room dungeon here. Um, I want to see if we can squeak at least six rooms in. Um, the dragonfly is telepathic. A roll table for the dragonfly. I do like that. Um, a roll table. Um, <laughs> they're playing tiddlywinks, basically. Yeah. Hypnofly totem. I love it. Well, okay, so why did the cultists value this, possibly this specific dragonfly, so highly? You know, it, 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 it could be a source of the buzzing for sure. But then that would mean the buzzing would end if they destroy it, which, like, That'd be a shame if it ended so soon. Although we're almost, you know, we're more than halfway through the dungeon. Um, table of Dragonfly Mutations. Is the dragonfly like a patron? Like if you guys have read, um, I know in some of the Shadow Dark adventures that are now out to the world, like Hideous Halls of Mugdalblub, Mugdalblub is a patron. It's an entity that's powerful enough to grant patronage um, and boons. So is, this, is the dragonfly that, you know? Um, an ancient intelligence... The ancient ancestor of all dragonflies. Yeah. Become a part of the dragonfly hive mind. Yeah, I wonder if you if you actually just swear allegiance to the dragonfly, or you can take it on as a boon. Um, so we'll, what we'll do is we'll add that to our or to our additional page of cool stuff that we're gonna write up for this specific adventure. Um, so we're gonna say like uh, you know, dragonfly patron plus boons. And like what, what is our chat saying for some of the boon ideas? We're saying we've got maybe some hive mind options. Um, what else would an ancient dragonfly offer people? Um, the empowered buzzing, predations. <laughs> Scott's like, did we just make a new Shadow Dark deity? Of course. Yes, we did. Um, it's some kind of... And like, it's funny because not every patron needs to be um, a deity, although some are, you know, shooting the vial notoriously is one of the only patrons and deities. Um, most of the other gods don't care enough about people to actually grant them boons or they don't think it would be right, but shooting the vial does. Um, so this dragon could just be a very powerful demon or entity. You know, it doesn't need to be a god necessarily. Um, speed of flight. Oh yeah, I definitely, we definitely need some kind of weird, like, um, flight of like options like limited you know it would, it would have to be limited in some way um but it can grant like limited flying um ooh, controlling insects maybe summoning giant dragonflies oh i think i went off the page here let me readjust her let me readjust what you can all see um uh this is this uh here we are dragonfly patron um, what are some other cool ideas? Fancy visions, generation speed. Dragonflies are comparably awesome hunters. It's very true. I mean, they're called dragonflies for a reason. So, so maybe we need to say some like uh, melee bonuses of some kind. Um, you know, like maybe maybe a boon is that you get advantage to attack. I definitely think dragonflies are melee fighters for sure. Um, so we'd want it to reflect that in some way. Um, all right, chat. So we'll come up. Oh, yeah, and the faceted eyes. Ooh, yeah, you're right. The faceted eyes are a big deal. So um, we're going to maybe have the, the, most, the most rare boon be something having to do with faceted eyes. So I'll write some stuff out for that after the fact here for us. But um, so that's what the cool dragonfly does. Let's note that on the altar um, in case in it, 
so glossy amber with an ancient cat's eyes dragonfly kid. This is um let's see wounds. This is um man, what's a good name for a fuzzy dragonfly patron? We need to like smash some weird syllables together. Let's let's try to smash some syllables together. All right. So, um where's my where's my where's my DM screen for this for All right. All right, everybody. Let's see here. Um I'm busting out the game master screen here. Thank you, Jesse, for drawing the art on it. My wife, Jesse, drew this. Woo. So cool. Um, and this has a names by syllable generator, which is super handy because you can generate all kinds of ancestry names and even monster names depending on how many syllables you want to use. Like, I usually will use the two syllables for dwarves. I'll use four for elves. Um, or like the middle two syllables for a goblin and we know prefix or suffix. So it, you can really like mix and match. So let's just start, let's just start slapping some syllables down and seeing if we get a cool weird name for this metal looking um, thing. Although Anisoptera is really cool. Loki's Lair just gave us that. Oh, you guys are already coming up with names. You know, we don't need this roll table. You guys are geniuses. Um, I always need roll tables because I am not as creative. So the Amber Pact, I love it. Oh, Zagzimanaz. Oh, Cameron, that's so cool, dude. Um, by the way, Cameron, the uh, person commenting in here, drew all the maps for Curse Scrolls. So awesome. Thank you. All the hex all the hex maps or Cameron's handiwork. Huge shout out. Man, I really like Loki's Lair's Anisoptera because it definitely sounds like ancient and flying-ish, and I like the buzziness. So let's call it Anisoptera Zizek, which is a combination of the Zs and the... I think that's so cool. Um, you guys are so smart here, so we're going to call this one uh, Anisoptera Zizek. Um, with an H, Zizek. Without the H there, Zizek. Oh, that's awesome. Anisoptera Zizek. <laughs> I love it. I want to use this in my own games immediately. Um... So this is very, very cool. Um, oh, is it, oh, Anisoptera is a scientific name for dragonfly. Okay, so let's like make it a little bit less. So Anisoptera, Anisoptera Zizek. Um, but the S sounds cool. I don't know. It just sounds right to me. Um, Xanisopterax. Oh, Xanisopterax. 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 Anisopterax? Yeah, Anisopterax is Zach. I love it. Oh, now it sounds like a T Rex, too. Um, yeah, yeah, we're, we're just taking the scientific name and making it cooler. Anisopterax. Anisoptera. I think that ending it on an A does sound right, though. Anisoptera. Zizek. I just like how it ends. Because like when you end something in a vowel, it just leads on well to the next word. So we're just changing the spelling slightly. Um, but it sounds super cool <laughs> with a Z. <laughs> so... Um, Let's see. Um, oh, is <laughs> I have questions about uh, uh, Solo Mode for Shadow Dark RPG. I really love Mythic GM Emulator. I, I don't think I could outright how how versatile and cool that is. Um, but I know Trevor loves delving into like non D and D style systems, and I, I can't fault him for that at all. He is he is prolific and covers broad everything. We're talking about Trevor Duvall, who has me myself and die. Um, super cool solo gameplay show. Incredibly inspiring and fun to watch. Um, please everyone check it out um, and tell him that uh, the Arcane Library adores his work so that he's creeped out by who this weird person is adoring his work. <laughs> who is this person? Um, so you could play Shadow Dark with Mythic without a problem. And I will be doing that. I'm going to be making a quick show about that, which is another one of our stretch goals for the Kickstarter campaign, which is what we're working on right now for all you newcomers. This was uh, this adventure was a stretch goal for the five hundred thousand dollar mark, mind boggling for Shadow Dark RPG, which is now open for late pledges if you still want to pick it up. Um, so all right, so here we are. We have a room or two more to write because um, we have a, it, we're totally going based on the space that we have, um, and this is 
Anisoptera Zek, um, a patron being. Uh, so we're going to leave the character's decision making up to how they handle the um, encounter with Anisoptera Zizek. Um, and it's going to be super fun to work up a short patron for that which we will do. So, okay, room five, you all. I think we have room for two more rooms in our mini dungeon here, which has been super fun so far. So uh, let's, let's draw some lines. Room four is gonna lead along to here. Oops, what did I do? I don't know if, I hope you all can see this. Let me line this up real quick. Um, I wanna be able to see what you guys can see. Okay, here we go. Um, Room four, I think I'm holding shift to keep this line straight. Oh yes, and that worked, so um, nothing's worse than a wobbly line. Um, and I think that, all right, first of all, room three should have a secret passage that connects somewhere. I think, all right, now remember how room three was the pond room, you all? I think that a tunnel leading down and then up so that the water from the pond is not continuously flowing down into a room. Down and then up to the second level will help us. Um, so I'm just gonna write a little note in here that this is up. Oops, what'd I do? Up. Ooh. I hate it when you make a text box and then you don't know what the heck's happening to it. We'll just try again. Um, boop. And I bet it's because we need this to be body copy up this is just so i remember when we uh when we actually make this map later so this is just a note but um so we're gonna lead this along here to here um that didn't look good <laughs> this series should actually just be called watching kelsey fight with um indesign <laughs> it's worth it i promise indesign's great um, why did that happen? Oh, a diagonal line. Why not? Let's do it. Diagonal line. I'm learning something all the time. Um, so we're going to make a big room here that we can, uh, turn into something. All right. This should work uh, like that. And then we'll just make this get there. The lines must touch. Good enough. Okay, this is just a mind map here. So um, room five will be here. And we're going to call this a secret passage, right? So I'm going to put that S right here. Well, here for now. Actually, you know what? Mm. Front. Bring to front. Boom. Ha! Huh. All right. So room five. Uh, I'm gonna, about to peek back at our chat now that we've got the kind of partial layout here. Um, okay, chat. Room five. Um, Kelsey verse in design. <laughs> um, <laughs> sponsored by Adobe. <laughs> oh, no. Um, all right. Yeah, this has been the, the fighting with the stream and then fighting with InDesign, but we're, we're good. Um, yeah, we spent, it was, a lot of time is spent perfecting layout, um, but it's kind of a fun little science. But um, all right, so room five, we're, we need to start introducing our dragonfly people. Um, yeah, Anisopter cultists hold up here. Uh, Kels against the machine. <laughs> Dragonfly nest chamber, trapped elemental. This is the molting room where the dragonfly cultists turn into dragonfly hybrids. Ooh, that's really cool. Um, a grand hall with tall beams dedicated to the dragonfly patron. Yeah, like I feel like we're looking at another kind of grand hall. Something important is definitely happening here. Um, you know, and uh, all right, so we've got a, a the grand. Let's call this a grand hall. Um, so we've got a. Uh, uh, pillared, um, towering room, uh, towering room, um, pillared towering room, um, 
do we want to say spacious so that we can talk more in detail about the pillars? Do we say that airy here? So we should say spacious towering room of carved stone, um, arched pillars, um, something, something. This is like a lofty, airy room. I do like the word lofty, spacious, lofty, or towering is the right scale. So we should say, we could say lofty pillars. Um, something has to be weird with pillars. Can you, you can't ever have normal pillars. Um, the boss could be a croak folk slash dragonfly abomination. What if the dragonfly people are like like megazording themselves through some weird like molting process into like a massive dragonfly monster that turns into something? Like, what if that's what they're doing? Like, yeah, maybe maybe they they're like you know getting rid of their um, <laughs> dragonflies. Yeah, like. Um, yeah, okay, so thought, 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 right? Because I love the idea of like, oh, yeah, dragonfly king, <laughs> it's buzzing time. <laughs> what if, okay, so what if, because like we can't, I can't write something that doesn't have horror in it and body horror is just too, too me. Um, so the dragonfly beings are like cultists, right? And maybe they've decided that it's time for apotheosis. Like they, 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 they can merge into like a dragonfly demon. Um, but we need one dude who maybe who got like who didn't who didn't cut the mustard, you know, like maybe there's like a dude laying in here surrounded by or a dying dragonfly cultist surrounded by like three dead croak dudes. Um, you know, and he was like, he's dying. He's like, I slayed the invaders and my brethren are and he like looks up to the tall ceiling where they're all like glued to the ceiling, like merging with each other. Um, you know, so the players have a chance here to decide are these the good guys or the bad guys? Yeah, it has to be Alien 3 style. So, okay. So, um, so uh, lofty pillars. We'll fill the rest of that in, but, um, you know, uh, three fro uh, croak folk, um, three contorted. Did we already say contorted? The guy who fell down? Are we re misusing the word contorted? Um, oh, no, we didn't. Three contorted croak folk lie around a twitching body a twitching man with faceted red eyes and glue like patches of iridescent scales so normally we don't want to over describe up front, but right now we want to set the scene of horror. Um, and so we want to explain that something weird's happening and what it looks like. Um, you don't want to just say a dude, because I think that even from a distance, it'll be obvious that this creature will be weird. We want it to be, we want it to be spooky right from the start. So we are over describing a little bit. We're breaking some rules here, but that's okay. Cause we have a reason this time. Um, so, oh, someone's asking where this will be available. It's going to be freely shared to everybody after I finish developing the map and everything because this is one of our stretch goals for every Shadow Dark player out there thanks to the backers on the Kickstarter who made this possible. Um, so, yeah, twitching entity. He His wings munched off. Good one, Matt. Um, so we're going to say, we're you know, we're going to create some sub bullets now. Um, uh, all right, so bullets. Uh man it doesn't always have to be a man either i'm just like I, I personally kind of use that word interchangeably for like a person um but let's let's say person because i kind of think that's that actually kind of gives them a little more humanity and then we can actually make this um possibly like you know whoever we want um so uh all right so it, 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 held up by by lofty pillars. Maybe the pillars, I, I, I tend to have this like design weakness where um, I make a, like I just can't leave pillars alone. They can't just be pillars, like they have to be carved or have some weird thing to them. I've never really just put in like normal pillars. So why don't I break the rules here and put in some normal pillars? Um, 
Uh, yeah. Ooh, hey, say Mike Shay's here. Icker dripping pillars. Yes, yes, because there's something going on here. Um, uh, ik, uh, coated in runnels of ichor. Um, so person and pillars. Because the pillars, there's something going on, right? Um, we're gonna just note this down before I forget, because I always forget my favorite ideas. Um, so we're gonna say like, uh, at top where they merge five dragonfly dudes. <laughs> this is just a note, this is a placeholder. Are merging into Megazord dragonfly. Is that how you spell Megazord? I, I've only ever said it, I've never written it. Um, and we're gonna say, okay, we're gonna say arched pillars, lofty, spacious tarn room held up by arching pillars. Uh, we don't need to say of carved stone, held up by lofty pillars. A spacious tarn room held up by lofty pillars. Um, I don't want to say like descriptive word, descriptive word. I don't want to be like arched lofty because we already said spacious towering room held up by lofty pillars. Um, arched, yeah, we'll just say arched. At top where they meet, five dragonfly dudes are glued to the ceiling. Merging into Megazord dragonfly. The ceiling E before I or I before E? Um, one thing that InDesign could really use is an inline um, word spell check thing like most modern word processors have. I, I would love that. Adobe, if you're listening. Um, Dragonzord. It is a proper noun, Megazord. <laughs> it's just a placeholder. Um, e, I, E, I, O. Okay. E before I, I before E, you know, except after Z and ending in something. I don't know that. Um, Save me, spell check. Save me. Um, all right. Wow. This is this is magnificent. We just have the coolest crowd. We have the coolest crowd of creative folks here right now. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, so let's get this last room hammered out. So we do have, you know, the five room dungeon precedent. It, it definitely is like a trick. Uh, is one of the 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 important elements in it. And I, I do feel this is a fun trick here. Um. You know, do you do you look up is the age old question. Um, edit preferences, autocorrect. Wait a minute, has this been here this whole time and I've written more than 800 pages of content without knowing this? Can I, can you, can I just define this revelation really quick? So edit preferences, autocorrect, edit preferences. Where are you preferences? Where are the pre spelling preferences? No, autocorrect. <gasps> I just need a minute here. I, uh, I've literally written hundreds of pages of Shadow Dark content without any form of autocorrect active because I didn't know you could. So that could have saved me dozens, if not hundreds of hours of work. The more you know, you just ask a friend next time. Just ask the internet. Um, so, all right, all right. Yeah, I just reached level 10, guys. Thank you. That was, you know, I was stuck at level 9 for so long. Um, <laughs> I've obtained level 9. Yeah, no, I'm at level 9 now. I can't, I'm not level 10 yet. I'll never reach level 10. That's the point. You never reach level 10. Um, so, all right. So, hairs could cover the room. Um, oh, man. Uh, let's see here. So, pillars are porous and filled with valuable hybrid eggs. Some intact. Ooh, this is so cool. You all have such cool ideas. Um, so let's, let's refocus on what we were writing. So spacious tower and room held up by lofty pillars coated in runnels of Igor. Um, so the, the, uh, so the Megazord dragonfly leaking Igor, because that's where it comes from, right? Ooh. Um, croak folk lie around a twitching person with faceted. So person is a dying dragonfly cultist. We're going to add that to the list of things we need to write later. Um, Monsters, so new monster. I'm just gonna, you know, my notes are totally crazy. Um, so we have croak, we already mentioned them, but croak, folk, dragon, fly, cultists, cool. Oh, and we need the dragon, fly, megazord. No, 
Megazord. Okay. So, um, the Megazord is in a sense the room. Um, uh, tryptophobic people afraid of porous things. I hate porous things. That is so me. Um, all right. So, here's my thought, right? We have this much space to work with. Um, I don't know if that's enough space for a sixth room, but it's definitely enough space for making the fifth room really, really, really majestic. So, dying dragonfly cultists. I feel like the PC should have a chance to talk to this person. Here's a question, chat. They should have, yes, definitely a chance to talk to this person before he dies. Let's note that he is dying. Um, dies in 1D, four rounds, unless saved in some way. Um, so I have two thoughts from this. One, we need more croak folk if there's going to be a final confrontation. So, because otherwise up to this point, the characters have slain the croak folk. Um, and then this Megazord will be for no reason if the players ally with the dragonfly people. I think that the Megazord needs to be mindless. You know, like if, if the cultists are merging their, their beings into some kind of dragonfly demon, I think they're giving up their humanity. Um, and so I don't know if this demon is going to be able to distinguish between friend or foe at this point. It's just like a, a, it's a creature of destruction. But maybe if they save this cultist and ally with him in some way, like it could be to their benefit. Um, it's always good to leave that possibility, right? So dies in 24 rounds unless saved. Um, uh... And this is where it all comes together and where we, we're getting complicated. So, large eggs holding that they have to fight each other to the death first to ascend to Zordom. Um, I'm not going to actually use the word Megazord in here. This is a placeholder um, note. So, we'll call it like, we'll just, we'll just say the, um, uh, you know, merging into a dragonfly demon leaking ick or we're going to say into mindless... Dragonfly demon licking, leak, leaking, leaking, wow, <laughs> it's hard to say. Arch, at top where they meet, are glued to the ceiling, dragonfly cultists. All right, let's clean this up. Cultists are glued to the ceiling, merging into a mindless dragonfly demon leaking. Ichor. Um, the, let's say they, they reach apotheosis in... 1d6 rounds and then attack all in sight um you know what you don't want this to be too soon so let's say let's just put a flat number on no let's actually just put it on a flat three flat three rounds um the characters i would tell them that they that they have um three rounds and and you want to be upfront with these typically these timers because the suspense is for players not for characters. Suspense affects the viewer. So during a horror movie, I always talk about this. Um, during horror movies, the the audience sees the killer stalking up to the protagonist. The protagonist couldn't be aware of it, of course, but the audience is aware, and that's what creates suspense. So remember, th remember that the players are your audience, and so when you have a timer that's creating tension, it's much more powerful if the players know about it. It's, you don't often want to hide timers from them unless we're talking about like a long-term timer, like a torch where the tension is not knowing how long. Um, knowing how long is oftentimes more powerful than not knowing. Just know that. So, um, all right. A, a dragonfly golem, proboscis hands. So I think that there's a chance, here's my thought. There's a chance that the characters will have allied with the frogmen at this point. Good. You know, then they have allies in this fight. I don't think we should provide the chance to ally with the dragonfly cultists. They're already too far gone, and they're merging into their um, apocalyptic demon being, and there's just no stopping it. So um, in a more complex dungeon, we would want the ability to ally with all the factions, but I think here it doesn't make sense, and I think that there is still the benefit to allying with the frogmen because then you have more allies in this battle. And if you don't, then that's okay. You simply don't have more allies in this battle. So... Um, 
uh, Will uh, refuses to ally with any, quote, invader. Um, we also need something in this final room that's worth the, worth the fight. So uh, we want there to be treasure. I think we need we need to go pinata on this. So pinata, um, because we we want the treasure to uh, maybe be part of this final combat. Um, what do y'all think? If if they defeat the dragonfly, he like kind of melts into sludge, leaving behind the valuable treasures that were possessed by the 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 beings who merged. Um, <laughs> No value in saving the cultist. So, no, you're right. We need value in saving the cultist. Um, uh, uh, refuses to ally with any invader, but will, but warns of coming doom. <laughs> with five O's. Um, let's say reluctant to ally with, with an invader, um, but doesn't want to die at hands of demon dragonfly demon so maybe maybe this cultist uh uh three headless that was right i forgot we were gonna add that lie around a twitching person with faster red eyes and patches of iridescent skills dying dragonfly cultist dies in 24 rounds we don't need to say unless save that's obvious um what's this person's name what should the dragonfly cultist name be? Because they're an NPC. They need to. They, they're gonna talk. Um, um, biological sack filled with gold glued to the ceiling. Ah, yeah, that's really cool. Um, what do the players get for saving the cultist? I think they should get something. They. they I think they can get an ally. Um, <laughs> Gregor. That's the name I always choose. Catrathus? Ooh, I, I, that sounds cool. Catrathus. I think this should be a female person, by the way, and I think that that actually fits. Um, Catrathus. Uh, stubborn. Let's give them some character traits. I think they're definitely stubborn, right? Because they're not dead yet. Stubborn and apocalyptic. Stubborn and apocalyptic. Uh, you know, doom, doom, doom preacher. Um, reluctant to ally with an invader. You know what? Yeah, okay, so let's make this more, um, warns, let's say warns of, of, uh, demon. Uh, see below. Um, AIDS enemies of the, f of the croak. Croak folk, wow, croak folk invaders. Okay. Yeah, no, I think if they take the time to save this person, then they will fight on their side. Um, This gets tricky though because the um, because I don't think that this this NPC would fight against their own the demon. I just don't think they would. Um, diverts attention of demon for one round. You know that gives PCs a chance to 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 avoid combat. I think that this being would be like. Take me into your arms, buzzing demon, you know, and, and you know, give me an honorable death. So, uh, distra uh, distracts demon for one round. Offer self as sacrifice. If alive. So if the if the PCs actually spend some time saving this person, um, she will uh, she will take its um, she will ta she will she will distract it for one round, uh, pulling all attacks um, for one round. So if they heal her and she doesn't just die immediately, if she doesn't just croak <laughs> immediately, um, 
then then she will spare the PCs some attacks as she embraces her demon god and uh, you know probably dies the way she wants to. Um, dragonfly armor, so dragonfly demon shedding a frogman body like a cicada. Ooh, yeah. I offer myself to thee as a happy meal. Um, yeah, yeah. She 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 um offers self as sacrifice to distract it for one round. Um, I think that's conveyed. I think it's conveyed that she wants to die to it. Um, uh, okay. So, um, so we'll say, uh, like, organic bag of treasure of holy relics glued to ceiling. Um, that'll be fun because the players are going to have to work to get it. Um, all right, I think we have enough croak folk. We have uh, six total. Um, we might want to say, instead of four croak folk, I think we might want to say six, right? Because that, that would be a genuine combat, and that seems like an important number. Four is a little thin. Um, that doesn't really seem like a fight at that point. That seems more like a, a, a roadblock. So, yes, they defeat the croak folk, um, the largest force of the croak folk, and then they move on to the dragonflies, and... Uh, we want to make the dragonfly really gnarly because um, having the croak folk as an ally would be helpful, you know? So, um, all right, and then the treasure is the holy relics glued to the ceiling. So, uh, formatting ideas, put pillars bullet before the person one for demon context. Yeah, you're right. Part of me wonders... Uh, I'm really like, I really like putting the most important thing first for the game master, although that's like, maybe that's just clinging to form. Um, let's see. Let's see if it makes sense to do that. Um, pillars, person. Uh, this makes sense, because I think there's an equal chance that they'll either look up once they see the ichor, or that they'll run to the person. I think they're both equally important. So yeah, this is, yeah, this should be fine. Um, cool. So organic bag of holy relics, uh, uh, organic bag, is bag the right word? It's like organic, uh, like intestine, <laughs> gross. Uh, yeah, the word sack is gross, but it's what we should, yeah. Uh, <laughs> organic, um, icker smeared sack of holy relics glued to the ceiling. Contents, this will be the final XP bomb for the group. Um, so, what is, yeah, uh, is it with a C when we're talking about an organic sack, or is it like always with a K? Um, utter, <laughs> utter, ew, that's so awesome, utter. Ugh, that's gross and awesome. Um, <laughs> it's just such a great, weird word. Okay, teratoma sack. Um, yeah, well, yeah, because we'll, we want the ichor to be dripping from the, the being on the ceiling. Um, bladder. It's bladder. That's the word. Bladder. Uh, filled with holy relics glued to ceiling. Yeah, gross. Um, we'll say fleshy because now we know it's organic. Inker smear bladder filled with holy relics glued to ceiling. Contents. All right. Um, um, uh, all right, yeah, dragonflies don't technically have udders, even though that is a great descriptive word for something like this and will be used in the future. <laughs> um, f yeah, fleshy gym is not gross. <laughs> there have been so many gross things. All right, um, let's get the let's get some ideas for treasure, and then we'll call this one, we'll kind of call this one a wrap. I think this one's like a, a classic five-room dungeon, um, and I'll get the map put up. The great thing about this is that each room has a lot of detail and interactivity. So we have fewer rooms, but we have a lot of cool interactivity in each one. Um, this is just the limitations of a, a mini dungeon, writing something on one page. So, um, i it's pronounced. Oh, perhaps. Um, all right. Staff of Anisoptera's priest. Yeah. Yeah. Like some kind of wand or staff. 
I think a complete armor set to go with the helm, that will be cool, but it might be a bit too easy, you know? I feel like there can't just be one dragonfly cult, like, and I think that giving someone, like, all the armor all at once might be, you know, we gotta, we gotta, we gotta give something to the, what, the spell casters. Um, cape and gloves, dragonfly bro brooch that forms wings. Yeah, for a limited amount of flight, this is hard because I don't want to duplicate the helm too much. Um, diadem summons a, yeah, yeah, I really like the idea of like, what if we have like a diadem of like those glittering eyeball looking gems and it can like summon a giant dragonfly once a day. Um, proboscis sword. <laughs> I wanted to have, yeah, I wanted to have something that, that, that maybe a spellcaster or any character could find of use. Um, so we're going to just put the con uh, uh, contents. We'll just put it as like some uh, indented. So we've got the uh, eye diadem. So um, first of all, let's let's put like 200 GP in gold dragonfly icons. Um, eye diadem, diadem. How do you all say that? Diadem, diadem. Uh, belt of speed. Um, yeah, number of gems. Each gem, yeah. Uh, so we'll say six gems. Six faceted rubies. Uh, destroy one to summon loyal giant dragonfly for five rounds. Um, we're gonna bold italic that because it's dragon dragonfly i diadem is that hard to say um man i wish i wish we could steal one extra line to add one more one line piece of treasure um let's try to steal a line dying dragonfly cultist warns uh should does Catrathus need to warn of the demon i think that is nice um fleshy uh fleshy icker smell batter um glued to ceiling we don't need to say filled with holy relics we're about to explain what they are yay look we saved a line um all right, 200 GP and dragonfly icons. All right, what's gonna be our last one line treasure? Um, a new incantation or ritual using the flower petals from the vines. Uh, yeah, we never really did come back to the vines even though we said we would. Um, that's okay because there's vine snakes. Um, <laughs> uh, look up with rapture and zeal. Yeah, you're right. Like they need to be like the demon. Um, Delete wars of, where did I put that? Warns of, um, oh, we can keep it. Um, a vine scroll, uh, uh, yeah, war, you're right. Warn isn't quite the right word. Um, uh, pray, uh, praise like heralds. What did you, what, what should we say? Um, heralds its birth, uh, praises, Arrival of Dragonfly Demon. Um, to it. Oh, we got another line. Ah, it's not enough spacing for two treasures, alas. Um, okay. Um, foretell. Yeah, foretell. Yeah, I feel like, man, these are all great words. Foretell's arrival of Dragonfly. Yeah, I feel like she'd be like, Praise be to the pending dragonfly demon. And I'm, um, you know, laying on her back looking up. Um, ritual dagger. I love ritual. I put a magic dagger in like every adventure I write. So I'm trying to, I'm trying to stay away from my uh, common, commonly tread paths. Although I love magic daggers. Something cursed. Yeah, something cursed. Something cursed would be cool. We haven't done anything cursed. We gotta be mean. It should be valuable, but cursed. Um, bag of salty flies. <laughs> Ritual dagger, all hail the dragon, behold the avatar. Um, a dagger that I would put on the ground with a scroll of polymorph, but only dragonfly form. Or like, yeah, like cursed cursed amber jewelry. Oh, we could, yeah, we could do a callback to amber. Um, 
should we say like an amber? Hmm. 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 Amber orb. That is cool. What would be, what would it do? An amber orb. Maybe this amber orb is what causes the, the dragonfly cultists madness. Like an amber, ooh, a torque is a very sword and sorcery style. Yeah, amber orb that causes, uh, I wonder how many lines of writing we can get in here. Let me just test, amber orb causes something to happen. Ooh, we can fit two lines, this is great. Um, so, uh, what does the amber orb do? Is it also magical? Um, starts dragonfly, the traps the user, drives one to the worship of the dragonfly. Yeah, um, should it be like grants a, yeah, a, should we say like, yeah, it's the heart of the dragonfly. Should we say like once a day can grant a luck token, but caught, but you must save versus the buzzing, like the buzzing haunts you. You have to make a check versus the buzzing. Um, luck tokens are kind of, they're great, but like, yeah, maybe we can make it even more specific. Allows you to speak with insects. That is really cool. Once a day, once a day speak to any insect, but, um, but the buzzing traps the user in amber. Haunted buzzing. I like the luck token on a successful buzz save. I feel like that's kind of a handy, that, that'll, we have, with the amount of space we have, I think that will work. So, um, amber orb, once, I'm gonna use shorthand here, once a day, gain a luck token. Ch uh, then DC, bleh, then, what, how did we word this earlier? The buzzing. Then DC 12 whiz or lose next action due to, yeah. 12 whiz or the buzzing. <laughs> it doesn't quite fit. Um, gain luck token, then D or the buzzing. Does that, would that make sense to people? Like if we put that in there, do you guys think if I reference back to the buzzing on the front here? Um, and why did I say dex? Whiz, it's wisdom. Or the buzzing. Um, what do you guys think? Or, cause, cause like, yeah, or the buzzing. Yeah, because the, the, the effect is called the buzzing. Then, or should we say then, uh, suffer the buzzing because um mm -mm -mm. cuz i want to say check first the buzzing because i want them to know that they need to make the check that it just triggers the buzzing but i don't want to imply that it actually triggers the effect without the opportunity for a check um I think this makes sense. Um, then suffer from. Yeah, I wanted to say suffer from as well, but I don't want to imply that you don't get the check to avoid it, because I think you should. Um, yeah, does the buzzing, it does have a check built in, so if I say suffer from the buzzing, I'm afraid that it would make someone think they don't get the check. Um, uh, yeah, and we don't technically have saving throws or saves in Shadow Dark. It's always a check instead. Um, so check first. Maybe I'll say check first the buzzing. Um, is that what I said? Oh yeah, that's what I said. So um, I think that makes sense. Check first the buzzing. People will know what that means. All right. Wow. Look at us. Look at us. We have a very set of detailed, cool th rooms. We've got five cool rooms. Um, I wonder if. It does, it is a little bit, the map is a little bit, um, the map's a little linear. You know, we don't have a lot of runaround, but hey, not, you know, not every map's gonna be a perfect, this is a five room dungeon, this is a one session thing, it's not meant to be um, a long exploration style adventure, this is focused on a particular 
story in this particular case. So um, may, when I draw the map, maybe I can try to create some empty chambers and some winding around and those will, what we'll do with those chambers is um, they'll probably be empty rooms or featureless. It's always good to have those. And then going down those paths to explore them is going to um, increase the chances of the players encountering some random encounters, which will work up. Um, so good question, Scott. How much XP for the final treasure? Uh, for, for like a good treasure hoard like this, I would give just a flat like either three experience or one for the gold, one for the amber, and three for the... Three for the um, the, di the diadem, because it's actually pretty cool. We gave a lot of cool stuff. Um, and this is actually a magic item as well, so I will work that up. We, we packed it with, with cool magic items in this one because it was just way too fun. So um, so definitely some great treasure hauls in here. And so what I'll do on the map is I'll add three to four rooms that are red herrings, um, you know, just places to explore that are mostly uh, random encounter traps. I'll add some croak guides to the random encounters. I might add like a a wandering dragonfly guy to the random encounters. Um, and then we'll work up a map and I'll share this out with everybody through the Kickstarter page and uh, socials, uh, Discord server, anywhere we can get this out. I'll attach it as a free download as well to all Kickstarter backers um, and backer kit. So um, yeah, this, this was super cool, you all. Thank you for helping write this awesome dungeon. You all wrote it, I didn't, I just was the layout monkey. Um, and, you know, we'll definitely make another pass to, uh, tighten up the writing and try to clear up any questions. Um, and I am excited to hear if you guys end up running this for your groups and, and what you think. So I'll get, I'll get this out there in the next day or two. Um, <laughs> sting bats on the random encounters. Oh yeah. I'll see if I can fit that in. Um, and thanks for uh, dealing with my rambling and the, uh, the stream problems at the beginning. Um, I'm glad we decided to do a separate new stream because that seemed to help. So, all right, everybody, uh, check your email for your backer kit, Shadow Dark Downloads. Enjoy that book. Let me know what y'all think, and we will catch you guys for the next round of stretch goals in the coming weeks. Okay, have a good afternoon, everybody. Thank you. Bye.